Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for being here for welcoming the stranger, immigration and faith communities. I'm Kelly Morrissey, Managing Director of the Center for Continuing Education at Yale Divinity School. The center is charged with providing opportunities for learning, professional development, and enrichment beyond the walls of the Divinity School, all at little or no cost. If you haven't already, I encourage you to check out our various programs, events, recorded lectures, and resources on our website, and we'll drop that URL in the chat later. I also want to introduce Megan Lukens, our communications coordinator, who's serving as our technical coordinator for this webinar. So if you're having any issues, please reach out to Megan directly. A couple of notes. Uh, first, background noise can be distracting for others, and we are recording the session, so please remain muted throughout our time together. We will uh, have the recording up on our website in the coming weeks, and we'll let you know when that's available so that you can rewatch it or share it with friends or colleagues who are unable to be with us today. For our time together this morning, first we'll have three relatively short lectures as far as lectures go. Uh, Dr. Baden will talk about immigration and the Bible. Dr. Yukic will take a look at modern religion and the stranger. And then Dr. Mercer will explore providing pastoral care. Then we'll take a short break at around 11.15. And when we regather, I'll introduce our panelists who are each working local with immigrants in various contexts. We'll then have a time of Q&A. So if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A or chat. And now I'm pleased to introduce our lecturers. Dr. Joel Baden is professor of Hebrew Bible and director of the Center for Continuing Education at Yale Divinity School. He is a specialist in the Pentateuch, Biblical Hebrew, and disability theory in biblical studies. Professor Baden is the author of numerous articles, essays, and books on individual Pentateuchal texts, critical methodology, and biblical Hebrew, and is working on commentaries on Deuteronomy and Exodus. His presentation today will be focused on the stories of the stranger in the Bible. Dr. Grace Yukic is professor of sociology at Quinnipiac University. Her areas of expertise are in religion, immigration, race, politics, and culture, and she regularly teaches courses in these areas. Her newest book, Religion is Raced, Understanding American Religion in the 21st Century, calls on sociologists, religious study scholars, and journalists to recognize the inextricability of religion and race in the United States. Professor Yukich is a National Research Fellow at the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture and an advisory board member for the National Museum of American Religion. Her presentation today will look at the influence of the stranger on modern American religion. Dr. Joyce Mercer is Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and the Horace Bushnell Professor of Practical Theology and Pastoral Care at Yale Divinity School. Professor Mercer's work focuses on the practices of care in diverse contexts and situations, including post-conflict areas of Southeast Asia, children in the U.S., addictions and family system, and the religious lives of adolescent girls. The practical theological thread running through her work is the fostering of liberatory hope where personal and social forms of suffering limit human flourishing. Her current project is based on a congregational study of churches in conflict with their denominations over sexuality. Dr. Mercer's presentation today will look at providing pastoral care for the stranger in our midst. Dr. Baden, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Kelly, and thank you to everybody for, for being here. Uh, in my guise as director of the Center for Continuing Education, I'm really excited to have the uh, have the opportunity to have this kind of uh, have this kind of get together and meeting and be able to bring people in from a variety of places. Uh, Thanks for the internet for allow allowing this sort of thing to, to take place, uh, both for panelists and for and for the audience. Um, so, my task here is to talk about the the status of the the stranger uh, or the the immigrant uh, in in the Hebrew Bible, which is my area of expertise. I frequently point out to uh, students and others that. The Hebrew Bible is, of course, uh, not a uniform text in almost any sense. It was 
written over hundreds of years by dozens of hands. And it would be relatively surprising uh, should everybody in the text, uh, every hand, every author, every voice agree on almost anything. Um, in fact, I, I often say uh, just about the only thing that every text in the Hebrew Bible can agree on is that Yahweh is the God of Israel and should be worshiped as such. And beyond that, it, everything else is, is essentially fair game. Uh, but there's a second thing that everybody in the biblical text seems to agree on, uh, and that is the status of and care for uh, the stranger, uh, the ger uh, in Hebrew. Um, the, the stranger, which is sort of a, a funny term to, to use because it obviously doesn't mean to us today what it, what it meant then, um, is, is a, a fairly clearly defined category. These are people who are natively from one uh, people group. Nation is probably not uh, quite correct uh, for, the, uh, for the ancient world that way, uh, who have migrated to, uh, to live among a different people group. Uh, and who have integrated into that society to one degree or another. Um, there are uh, strangers who dwell in the land for a generation, for multiple generations. Um, there are strangers who come to different lands to work, uh, to, to live, to marry. Uh, and uh, so, and this was a, a broad Near Eastern, well-known phenomenon. Um, and, and most every uh, most every people in that uh, period of time would have understood what this what this word meant and what it, what it conveyed. Uh, it is effectively equivalent to our uh, current term immigrant. And personally, uh, it's my preference to translate the word "ger" uh, as immigrant rather than a stranger. I think it has a much uh, greater resonance for for modern readers. What we are to do with the presence of the stranger uh, or the immigrant in our midst is again something that biblical texts are almost entirely uniform uh, about uh, not just in stories but in in the, the programmatic text that is the law codes uh, there are three major law codes in the first five books of the bible uh, there's one in exodus there's one in leviticus and there's one in deuteronomy and all of them include essentially an entirely straightforward statement about how to treat uh, the immigrant, the gare, the stranger. In Exodus 22, we read, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In Leviticus, we read, when a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So, you know, th right there, we've got sort of the, the equivalent of the golden rule uh, expressed with regard to, to the immigrant. And in Deuteronomy, we read, you shall not subvert the rights of the stranger. So all of the law codes are very clear uh, that the, the stranger is to be treated well, to be treated as one of your own, uh, to be uh, not taken advantage of, of course, an incredibly, um, as, as we know from today, an incredibly vulnerable position uh, to be a foreigner uh, in, a, in a foreign land uh, without any of the protections of family or kinship uh, to, to ensure one's safety. So the laws are, are clear, right? We need to do what we can to, to make sure that these people are not oppressed uh, given their vulnerable status. Beyond the law codes, however, um, which are sort of the easiest place to start. Uh, I wanna to point to a few other texts, um, starting with uh, some, some narratives uh, that I think may not often be read as commentaries on treatment of the stranger, but I wanna suggest we could read in that, in that light. And I think, we'll, uh, I think are, are based on common biblical ancient understandings of, uh, of how the stranger is to be, the immigrant is to be treated. Starting very broadly, Almost the entirety of the book of Genesis, the entire story of Israel's ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a, a sort of a commentary from a very positive perspective of how the immigrant is to be treated. As we know, right, Abraham is essentially the world's first immigrant, um, according to the Bible. Uh, Abraham 
comes from Mesopotamia to this uh, foreign land, to Canaan, where there are plenty of people who live there already. And the encounters of Abraham and his family with the native inhabitants of the land are, again, almost entirely, if not entirely, positive experiences. So, for example, um, in, uh, in Genesis uh, 12, uh, uh, and, and in a few other cases where Abraham has to travel uh, even from Canaan because of, of famine, he and his family, um, he and his wife, Sarah, and they, and they find themselves in uh, Egypt or in, uh, in Philistia, uh, having been forced from their homes uh, by, I don't know, let's call it climate change just for the sake of making it modern. Uh, and, and they come to these places and they're always treated well. These are, these are stories in which Abraham is sure that he's going to be treated badly. Uh, he's, these are the stories in which Abraham tries to pass Sarah off as his sister so that the, you know, the, the king won't uh, kill him because his wife is so beautiful. He's worried about how he'll be treated, about his vulnerability. But in none of these cases does he actually have to be worried. Um, you know, when he arrives in, uh, in Philistia, he's told, you know, here, here's the land, settle wherever you please, right? The king says, anyone who molests this man or his wife shall be put to death. Um, Abraham is a stranger in a strange land and at the mercy of these foreign powers and is treated perfectly well. Uh, so too, with every other version of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's encounter with uh, with with the native peoples. Uh, Abraham wants to bury Sarah in what is Hittite land and the Hittites fall all over themselves really to allow him to do so. Uh, it, 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 the, there is not a single negative encounter in Genesis between uh, one of the Israelite ancestors and the peoples who inhabit the land that they, are been want, that they are wandering around. So Genesis as a whole stands as kind of a model, right? This is how our ancestors were treated when they came to this land. And that obviously changes dramatically as soon as we get into the book of Exodus, uh, where the Pharaoh in Exodus one is sort of the negative inverse uh, of, of the way that uh, Abraham and his, and his offspring were treated in Canaan. Pharaoh, of course, uh, exhibits an enormous amount of fear at the rising numbers of these non-native inhabitants, these uh, Israelites settled in Egypt. And the fear that he has leads him to sort of policy decisions, uh, one could say, that are obviously uh, extraordinarily cruel and oppressive uh, and become the paradigm, obviously, for Israel of what not to do, right? You are strangers in the land of Egypt. You know what it's like to be taken advantage of and to be oppressed. You can't do that to anyone else. It's very easy to, to, to look at, at Pharaoh and say, well, this is obviously uh, you know, an awful human being doing terrible things to this, uh, this immigrant population, a refugee population, really, because of course they're there because of famine. One of the things that uh, I think is often lost when we think about the Exodus story, uh, we talk about how awful and terrible Pharaoh is. Uh, we often miss, so, uh, even though I think we, we know it, uh, we know it is sort of uh, as part of the story, but we forget it intuitively. There are two pharaohs in the Exodus story. Uh, there's the pharaoh of Exodus one who enslaves and oppresses the Israelites. And then some time later, there's the pharaoh who interacts with Moses, who is obviously not the same pharaoh, we're one or more generations on, but who also oppresses Israel, but in a different way, right? There's the pharaoh who, implements uh, the policy of oppression. And then there's the Pharaoh, and there are probably more than one of them along the way, the Pharaohs who maintain that policy, right? Even in the face of perhaps knowing uh, that it's wrong. And to me, at least, this is a, you know, a, a useful thing to remember for modern parallels of, uh, you know, there, there's, there are policies that were awful to begin with and we can all uh, recognize were bad, but the policymakers who continue those policies uh, are still participating in the same, the same oppression. Uh, so I think we should be clear when we think about Pharaoh and Exodus, uh, that we remember there are, there are two sides to that kind of oppression uh, and, and, and both of them are, are, are awful. 
once Israel finally leaves Egypt and is traveling through the wilderness, there are at least two other examples of, uh, of kings who are, again, afraid of the number of Israelites, afraid of this immigrant population or migrant population, perhaps better. Um, as they're traveling through the wilderness, they come to, the Israelites come to the Edomites, whose land they have to pass through in order to get to Canaan where they're, where they're going. They're not looking to dwell there. They want no part of living in Edom. They just want to pass through. And they say, right, you know all of the hardships that have befallen us and, you know, how our ancestors went down to Egypt and they treated us so badly and, you know, we were freed by God. And now here we are at the border of your territory. Let us just cross through. And the king of Edom says, uh, you cannot pass through this territory uh, or we will come, you know, defeat you in battle. Uh, and so Edom essentially forces them away at the border and makes them go, you know, the long way around, as it were. Uh, and again, this is a story that I think we, we rarely read as a, as a tale of how to treat uh, immigrants or, or strangers. But it's, it is a pretty good example of how not to treat the refugee, it, especially even in this case, one who doesn't want to dwell in the land, but just to cross through it to reach the, their destination beyond. Uh, there are obviously many modern parallels to this particular situation, be it in... Um, you know, the, uh, the Americas or in Europe. Uh, and certainly one can think of many such examples from, uh, from earlier in the 20th century of the same phenomenon. But again, here's a story of, uh, of a people that simply wants, to, simply wants to move from one place to the other and is denied that, uh, denied that right uh, by, by, a, by a foreign power. And the second such example, uh, is the the story about the king Balak again a little bit later in the in the book of Numbers, um, who is the one who hires the prophet Balaam to come curse Israel, and you know Balak's statement about Israel is 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 a is a pretty remarkable one. He says, "As I see them from the mountain tops, as I gaze on them from the heights, this here is a people that dwells apart, not reckoned among the nations." This is essentially to identify Israel as a refugee people, right? They, they have no homeland. They are not reckoned among the nations. And even so, they're viewed as something of an existential threat by Balak, uh, the king of, of Moab in this case. Again, uh, what we have here is in the case of Pharaoh in Egypt and the king of Edom and, and the king of Moab, we have a, an expression of fear of uh, a migrant people. Uh, it's it's not a particularly well defined fear, um, but it causes them to sort of <laughs> implement what we would call policy decisions uh, that are 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 fairly cruel. When we look at the stories of Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers as a whole, and we see the various ways that Israel or Israel's ancestors are treated, right, we can you know ask the fairly uh, straightforward question: Who are we meant to emulate in these stories? It's, fair, it's fairly clear that Pharaoh and the king of Edom and the king of Moab are the bad guys. And that somewhat ironically, all the Canaanite peoples in Genesis are the good guys in, in, in terms of how they, how they treat the immigrant. Um, so I think that considering these stories, again, as, as models of what to do or what not to do, uh, is, is a, a useful way of framing them for the conversation of. Uh, of how immigrants are treated. Uh, when we read these stories, again, who, who are we supposed to be emulating? Uh, which model are we supposed to be following? Uh, and again, I think the Bible is relatively clear about this, even if it doesn't sort of say so out loud. Uh, I wanna think next about the question of Israel's own status. As we were just saying, Abraham and his uh, offspring exist as foreigners uh, in the land of Canaan. And eventually, of course, in the story, they go to Egypt and they come back and they settle into Canaan as essentially uh, as Israel, as a, as a, as a what we call sort of sovereign nation, um, where they're no longer, in theory, strangers. Uh, but we get laws then about how they're supposed to treat strangers in their own midst. 
But I want to put forward the proposition that, in fact, Israel in the Bible is always uh, a stranger, uh, an immigrant, or a resident alien, to use the, the technical term that I think is fairly out of date now. Um, as I said, when they are living in Canaan in the book of Genesis, uh, the Bible is quite explicit about their, about their status. Uh, we, Jacob, we're told, uh, settled in the land where his father had been an immigrant, had been a stranger. Uh, and this is a, a, a theme that is a, and a phrase that comes up over and over again in the text. Uh, Canaan wasn't the homeland for Abraham or his family, right? It's the place where they were, uh, they were strangers, right? Israel has its beginnings in uh, immigrant uh, status. Of course, Israel obviously uh, was immigrants, uh, refugees, and strangers in Egypt. Uh, as we said, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of a stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. Uh, and in this case, knowing how awful it can be. The interesting part is when Israel gets back to Canaan, after having lived in Egypt, despite the fact that we have all this language about God giving them the land and God uh, giving them the, the power and uh, dispossessing all of the native peoples to clear space for Israel to dwell there uh, in its own land, as it were, the Bible still declares uh, Israel to be uh, strangers. Uh, it's, it's just framed slightly differently. God says, in Leviticus 25, the land that is Canaan is mine. I'm the owner and possessor of, of this land. You, Israel, are but strangers resident with me. In other words, even when they're settled in the promised land, Israel is still has the status of the of the stranger, right? They're still uh they still need to recognize that there is, in fact, uh, a greater power, as it were. There is uh, a true owner of the land. Uh, so they, they maintain that stranger status um, all, the, all the way through, uh, which, again, I think is intended to remind them how to treat the strangers in their, in their own midst. And the final step in this one is uh, in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, who you know is often uh, I think read as uh, quite a uh, anti foreigner sort of uh, sort of prophet. Ezekiel reminds Israel, thus said the Lord God to Jerusalem, by origin and birth you are from the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. In other words, Ezekiel recognizes uh, that. Despite Israel's claim to the land it dwells in, by origin and birth, Israel is immigrant and mixed. And all of this, I think, uh, all, the, all this, I think, speaks to the notion of the status of Israel uh, in the Bible. And of course, for those of us who uh, sort of associate ourselves with being the continuation of Israel, we too uh, trace, our, trace ourselves back to immigrant roots. Um, and there are obvious modern parallels to be drawn with tracing, uh, you know, with, you know, modern America uh, tracing itself also largely to immigrant roots, but thinking of itself as native to, uh, to this land, uh, obviously, I think, to its own detriment. Uh, the last major bit I want to talk about here, uh, biblically, is uh, some of the eschatological visions uh, that we find in the text that have to do with uh, with the immigrant and the stranger. Um, now, eschat eschatology as visions of sort of the world to come. Uh, in the Bible, do a couple of things. Um, they are both obviously looking forward to a time when things will be better, uh, but not doing so, I think, as a thing to be sort of waited for, but rather as a thing to be to be brought about. Uh, they're also, for the most part, eschatological visions tend to be uh, people's imaginations of the best possible version of the world we live in now. Right? Uh, 
not some revolutionary, uh, you know, completely different altered universe. Those kinds of visions will come later. Uh, but as you know, the the best the best world we could possibly make. And so it's fascinating, I think, uh, that we find uh, in some of these eschatological visions uh, notions not of Israel taking over everything or everybody becoming Israelite even, but language of the uniting of all the peoples from all the different lands. Uh, Isaiah uh, talks about uh, gathering the dispersed of Israel, that is all the people from exile, but also gathering with them uh, everybody else. I will gather still more to those already gathered. Um, Ezekiel, again, uh, wonderfully says, uh, looking forward to uh, this, this, uh, this future, uh, talking about you're going to divide the land up for yourselves among the tribes of Israel, right? So in the, in the world to come, when everyone is returned from exile and, uh, and sort of the end times are upon us, the land will be uh, divided among Israel as it was in the past. But good, then goes on, you shall allot it as a heritage for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you. Right? You shall treat them as Israelite citizens, Ezekiel says. They shall receive land allotments with you among the tribes of Israel. Right? They're gonna, you should give them allotments of land wherever it is that they happen to dwell. So Ezekiel's eschatological vision in which immigrants have chosen to sort of become part of Israel, uh, maybe have even intermarried, I mean, these are these are people who, in modern parlance, we would call dreamers. Perhaps uh, they shall be treated as citizens, uh, even receiving allotments of inheritable property, which is almost unthinkable uh, in 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 sort of uh, the majority of of biblical thought. Uh, Israel receives the land, and here Ezekiel is saying, if if people want to be part of us, if they want to come live among us, they should be able to do so, not just now indefinitely. Um, and the, the last one of these eschatological visions I want to point to is one that is probably almost never visible uh, to most readers of the text. And it's an incredibly famous passage. Um, in Isaiah 11, when uh, Isaiah is imagining this, you know, remarkable, peaceful, utopian future and says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, right? The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. That, that, that's the verse we're talking about. Uh, the word dwell, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, is actually the word for reside as a stranger with. Okay. Uh, so this, the same root, it's not just live alongside, it's right, live as, um, as an immigrant with. And I think that gives a, a, a far richer reading to what's happening in this text and also of course makes it far more relevant to today's discussion. The eschaton, the time to come, uh, will be a time when even those who were once perhaps deemed dangerous, a wolf, uh, are welcomed into and live uh, in and among uh, the, the greater society. Um, conscious of, uh, of, of time, uh, I want to, and, and leaving perhaps room for questions if there are any, uh, and also, of course, space for my fellow panelists. Uh, I want to I want to end here with just a, a few extra uh, thoughts. When we think about how to read the Bible uh, for contemporary uh, thoughts like this, contemporary issues, we need to remember, of course, that the Hebrew Bible is the product of a place and time very, very uh, different and distant from our own, and so. A one-to-one -one correspondence is, is rarely going to be uh, obvious or at hand. Um, ancient Israel and the ancient Near East in general was a, a, a place and, and a time when being an immigrant or a stranger was common. Right? We can see in the stories of the Bible how often, uh, for example, famine uh, you know, natural climatological events uh, force people to move from one place to another. War displaced people. Um, 
So there were, uh, there were all kinds of uh, pressures that forced people to be constantly moving from place to place. Right? Being a stranger uh, was, you know, almost expected that, that it would happen at some point. Um, if not to you, then to your descendants or had ha happened to your ancestors. It was a, an absolutely common phenomenon, which is very different from sort of America today, for example, where the, the world is such that we at least can hardly imagine ever finding ourselves in the position of being forced to being forced to move uh, and relocate to a, a different country without any ties to family. Uh, you know, we do that for fun and call it vacation. Um, we, we hardly ever think that it's going to happen to us, even as we know that it's going to happen uh, and happens constantly to others. But in the biblical world, everybody understood that this was a possibility, if not in fact a likelihood. So the need for every civilization and every culture then to be welcoming and supportive and caring for the stranger was really an act of reciprocity. We care for the stranger because we know what it was like, whether in Egypt or elsewhere, and because we wanna make sure that when it's our turn, we too are, uh, are, are treated well. You know, in large part, I think this sort of uh, common background, uh, you know, of people's living in a, in a in a, a place where still the climate is actually such that, you know, a few hard years uh, of, of drought can force people to move. Um, this is a, a situation where, uh, again, it was totally expected that this was, was going to happen. Uh, and so this is self-protective and uh, it's, as I said, accounts for, I think some of today's uh, still uh, strong, um, the strong value of hospitality in that in that region. Um, again, we're distant from that, both in time and place, and also in experience of what of what life is like. Uh, but you know, the the Bible is partaking of a sort of broader culture and broader cultural ethic that um, you know maybe has a a broader view than our own, especially given. Uh, given what's happening with, with climate change and its increase uh, in, in our own day. Um, at the same time, we obviously live at a time when the sheer number of immigrants uh, currently moving around the globe is far greater than anything the Bible could ever have imagined. Um, you know, so again, one-to-one -one correspondences are very hard to, to pin down with any, uh, any certainty. Uh, the last comment I wanna offer uh, is when I have talked about uh, about uh, the biblical uh, value of caring for the stranger, uh, or others have, uh, one of the pushbacks that is 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 often offered, um, such as it is, is yes, that's well and fine, but the biblical laws and statements are are meant for individuals, and not for governments. Uh, it's about how we as individual believers are meant to treat uh, foreigners, strangers, and immigrants, but it doesn't say anything about sort of how public or governmental policy uh, should be implemented. And I wanna take this opportunity to simply pro proactively and preemptively say, uh, that's not right. <laughs> um, uh, or at least that distinction between the individual and the government uh, is, is not really a distinction that exists in the Bible, in the biblical texts, right? There are no laws in the biblical text for the government, so, you know, per se. Um, uh, and I think that even more so it's the case that today in America, when we have a government that is explicitly said to be, right, of, by, and for the people, uh, there is not a distinction between uh, sort of government policy and individual ethics. Um, to conclude, I guess, I often say uh, that there is a danger in holding up the Bible uh, to try and address various, you know, contemporary social problems. Um, the Bible, as I said, is an incredibly varied text. And for every text we can hold up that seems like it 
you know, uh, supports whatever values we're, we're pushing for, there are other texts that uh, will push back in the other direction. The Bible is a pro-slavery, pro-death penalty, um, you know, uh, patriarchal, uh, sexist, it's all, all, the, all the things, right? Um, uh, so, you know, if we hold up texts and say, uh, we should act this way because the Bible says so, we're simply giving license for others to hold up other texts that we're not so fond of and say, the Bible also says this. Uh, having said that though, as I said at the beginning, care for the stranger and immigrant is one issue where the biblical witness is just so strong and so univocal that it, it really does stand out from almost every other claim that can be made about uh, what the Bible says. Uh, caring for the immigrant like is the biblical word. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's what I have. Uh, Kelly, would you like me to look at my own uh, questions? Um, sure, or I'd be happy to read it to you. I can read them. I'm good at that. Um, okay. Assuming it's just the, the, the couple that are in the Q&A. Um, so I, I think I have, what, like five minutes or so? Yes. Cool. Um, so uh, the first question is, how does this discussion of stranger apply to the current Palestine and Israel tension? Whew. Um, that's not a small question. Uh, so without, you know, sort of giving a perfectly clear answer that uh, probably uh, would be uh, inaccurate and, and, and too simplified, what I would say is, again, the, the question of what the status of Israel or perhaps uh, Palestinians are in this discussion um, is, is not is not a question of like one people is the host and one people is the is the stranger, right? Uh, everybody is in this case. Everybody in that situation is a stranger to this land, one way or another, right? However far back we want to be going, uh, and again, I think that the you know uh, where I think this is the biblical text is useful here is the reminder that uh, sort of once a stranger or an immigrant, always a stranger or immigrant, uh, no matter how many generations on we are. Uh, and for those certainly who think that the, um, uh, who think of Israel as being sort of a holy land, the verse uh, that I, I brought up where God says, uh, the land is mine and you are all strangers with me. That's a verse that would apply to literally everybody living in that, in that space. Um, you know, the Bible sort of uh, equates uh, all of the inhabitants of that, uh, of that region uh, as, as being being equally strangers in, uh, in God's land. Uh, so uh, that's what I'll say about that without uh, trying to uh, step on too many toes. Uh, the other question I have is, how would you respond to us, quote, not having enough resources to support the illegal immigrant? Well, I'm not sure what the Bible uh, has to say about that, I must admit. Um, uh, and I actually, I'm gonna leave uh, a sort of policy discussion, I think, uh, I'm gonna leave that to, um, to future conversations here. Uh, uh, but again, one of the things that the Bible uh, talks about, or at least one of the ways the, the Bible presents uh, the status of the, of the immigrant, of course, in the Bible, there is no such thing as the legal or illegal immigrant, right? There are just immigrants. Um, uh, but, you know what the Bible is talking about is is making sh is, is making sure on a, a really on a local communal level, right? It's not the individual who's required to support the the immigrant in their midst. The Bible's texts are almost always written to and for sort of local communities, but the local community is supposed to ensure that everybody, all of its vulnerable peoples, and that's immigrants and widows and orphans, right, um, are the three main categories. It's supposed to make sure that they are cared for. And we have stories about, uh, you know, the book of Ruth, of course, is just an entire lengthy discourse on how one should treat uh, an immigrant. And yes, there's one guy, Boaz, who takes very good care, but it's the entire community that comes together to ensure that, uh, that Ruth and Naomi are welcomed. Uh, so, you know, whatever we're talking about resources, uh, 
we don't need to be thinking about individual resources uh, or we don't even need to be thinking about money necessarily, at least not from the biblical perspective. Um, uh, okay, the last question, and then I'll stop, is does categories and groups as refugees and immigrants uh, as such make them faceless? Um, it's really, you know, again, and I, I'll speak only to this from the biblical perspective and let uh, questions like that also be uh, come up later in our conversation today. But it's interesting that when Israel is told to welcome and care for the stranger, um, they're they're faceless and nameless insofar as you know they're obviously they're, it's a it's a category, but in that you know broader categorization, it it sort of by talking about it that way in a sense it levels everything out right like it doesn't matter who you're who you are or where you're from right it's not be nice to the strangers from this area but not to the strangers from this place right all strangers uh, all immigrants are uh, are equally worthy of and deserving of uh, of care and protection but there's also the personalization of the immigrant experience in the in the the israelite patriarchs themselves abraham is not neither faceless nor nameless but has absolutely the experience of the immigrant at the mercy of the host peoples, um, searching for uh, you know a place to live and people to take care of him, and and needing that kind of support. Uh, so, you know, we can both, as we think about uh, immigrants through the biblical lens, we can both personalize each each immigrant is like an Abraham. And we can generalize all immigrants, regardless of who they are, or where they're from, uh, are deserving of care. Okay, uh, I'll stop there and uh, turn it back over to Kelly. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we are pleased to have Dr. Grace Yukic. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and I really enjoyed um, your presentation as well, Joel. It was really, um, really illuminating to hear more about um, some of the translations of um, various parts of Hebrew scriptures on this. Um, so I'm just delighted to be here to be a part of this panel. Um, as uh, Kelly mentioned earlier, I'm a professor at Quinnipiac University and um, I study religion and immigration. Um, so I'm just really happy to be a part of this panel today. I do have some slides that I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to share my screen um, and just cross our fingers that all goes well with that. Um, so give me one moment. Okay, so I hope that everyone can see this. Um, all right, so, um, So yeah, the, the name of my talk today is Immigration and Modern American Religion. And I've chosen to focus on a specific part of that. And that is the practice of sanctuary. Um, and there's a couple of reason reasons I chose to talk about that today. One is that um, sanctuary plays a really important role in um, immigrant rights work today among people of faith. Um, but also it's because a lot of my research has been on sanctuary. So it gives me a chance to talk with you a little bit about that. Um, so I wanted to just start with uh, a chart on some recent data on um, religious Americans thoughts about immigrants. Um, and as most of us on this uh, webinar probably realize, Americans have very complicated views about immigration, and those views vary really widely by religion. So people from different religious groups, indeed from different religio-racial groups, feel very differently from each other about immigration. And as this chart from PRI shows, um, much anti-immigrant sentiment is voiced by white Protestants. So you can see those top two categories there of white evangelical Protestants and white mainline Protestants. Um, over half um, of each of those groups say that immigrants threaten traditional American customs and values. Um, and then close to half on, uh, but also, um, far more than half for evangelicals 
say that immigrants are invading our country and replacing our cultural and ethnic background. Um, and white Catholics are up there too, so don't want to leave them out. <laughs> um, so much of my own research on immigration and religion has really focused on, on this group, on um, white Protestants and to a slightly lesser degree, white Catholics and efforts by people from those backgrounds to change what they would call uh, the hearts and minds of their fellow uh, white religious people, their fellow white Christians about immigration by using a practice called sanctuary. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, and a lot of this research comes from my book. Um, so um, Kelly was, uh, was lovely enough to mention my most recent book, which is um, Religion is Raced. Um, my prior book before that one, uh, my first book was called One Family Under God, Immigration Politics and Progressive Religion in America. Um, and this book was based on two years of ethnographic research with religious immigrant rights activists, um, mostly activists that were part of um, what they were calling at the time, the new sanctuary movement. Um, I did about 70 interviews with people who were part of the movement and um, analyzed thousands of uh, documents um, from the movement on the work that they were doing. So um, what I really want to focus on today is uh, where this idea of sanctuary as a faith-based strategy for immigrant rights comes from, um, how sanctuary has looked in the past and how it's different today, and then finally, what are some of the promises and challenges of sanctuary as a faith-based strategy for social change? So I, I wanna start by, with something that um, really, I think um, aligns well with uh, the prior presentation, which is the history of sanctuary in ancient Israel. So many sanctuary activists trace their practice back to ancient Israel as this painting of the ancient temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, as it looked in the 10th century BC, uh, might suggest. So many of these activists point to Joshua 20, um, which in the new international version says, then the Lord said to Joshua, tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. Then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive because the fugitive killed their neighbor unintentionally and without malice aforethought. They are to stay in that city until they have stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Then they may go back to their own home and the town from which they fled. So um, this practice of having places where um, people are protected, um, people who uh, others may see as having done something wrong are protected from um, the, uh, the kind of potential you know, consequences of that supposed wrongdoing for a time um, is something that really has very long roots um, for people who um, trace their, their religious ancestry to, uh, to Judaism, including Christians. Um, so that's a really important um, part of the Jewish and Christian history that many people in the sanctuary movement drew on pretty regularly. Um, in the Middle Ages, um, we see a little bit of a change. Um, so from about the 7th to the 17th centuries CE, English common law allowed criminals to take refuge in churches. So we're moving from cities of refuge, which was the, the tradition in ancient Israel, to specific um, houses of worship and other sacred sites that were designated as sanctuaries. And this was typically for a period of up to 40 days. So Roman law as far back as the fourth century also recognized some kind of a right to sanctuary. So again, we see another example um, historically of some sort of sanctuary being practiced. Um, and in, in the US, there's really never been a legal right 
to sanctuary the way that there was, you know, in English common law or in um, the laws of ancient Israel. Um, but there have been many instances of it being used to protect people who are fleeing from unjust laws, such as during the Underground Railroad, um, also during the Vietnam War. Um, some Vietnam War resistors were offered sanctuary in houses of worship uh, to protect them from the consequences of, of resisting the war. But really, um, the most well-known example of sanctuary in contemporary times is um, a movement that really got going in the 1980s that came to be called the Sanctuary Movement. And as for anybody who isn't familiar with that movement, um, most of you probably are, but just as a quick review, um, during the 1980s, hundreds of churches and synagogues housed immigrants who were fleeing civil wars in Central America. Um, and at the time, INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services, often tried to deport uh, immigrants fleeing civil wars in Central America without regard to their asylum applications. So, you know, sounds very familiar to us today, I think, um, just with a different group, ICE, um, being the one doing the deporting. So by living temporarily in churches, the idea is that immigrants were protected from deportation for long enough to hopefully have their asylum cases heard and to potentially receive asylum in the US. So during the 1980s, the practice of sanctuary had several characteristics. First, most of the immigrants who were being um, provided with sanctuary were from Latin America, especially Central America. Um, most of the organizations providing sanctuary were Christian churches. Um, many of the immigrants were recent refugees, recent arrivals who really needed shelter and needed resettlement. Um, those were the primary needs um, facing people. Um, and they resided in churches and um, it was considered, um, well, authorities often just kind of accepted what was happening because it looks bad to drag immigrants from churches, um, but they did end up finding a way to arrest and prosecute some of the people who were involved in the sanctuary movement at the time. So seven people ended up being convicted of crimes associated with their sanctuary work, though they did not serve prison sentences. So in thinking about some of the consequences of that 1980s movement, um, it can be argued that the movement uh, saved the lives of many immigrants who maybe otherwise would have been stuck in Central America, um, may have um, fallen victim to uh, the violence of many of the US funded and trained um, right wing death squads in places like El Salvador and Nicaragua. Um, so we, we saw people's lives being saved as a result of these actions. Um, and it did raise awareness about American foreign policy um, and changed, resulted in some changes of that foreign policy. So what about today? Um, how and why might sanctuary as a faith-based strategy for immigrant rights differ today compared to the 1980s and some of the prior incarnations of sanctuary we've seen. So when I first started studying the movement of people that called themselves, at least initially, the new sanctuary movement, it was back in 2006. Um, and a piece of legislation had been passed in Congress called the Sensenbrenner Bill, which would have made assisting undocumented immigrants a felony. Um, and a group of activists who were very upset about this um, sought to revive the practice of sanctuary by organizing something they started calling the new sanctuary movement. And it had its official launch in May, 2007. Most of my research for my book really focused on that iteration of sanctuary between 2007 and 2010. And then it's continued to kind of morph during the last 10 years into something that has some similarities and some differences um, compared to what I studied during, during my primary research period. So this movement launched in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Seattle, and San Diego. But by 2010, it included over 30 local coalitions all around the country and over 100 religious communities. 
local coalitions stay in touch with each other through the movement website, through national conference calls, and national gatherings. At that time, the movement was explicitly interfaith with involvement from Jews, Muslims, Catholics, and Protestants, but it was mainly made up of mainline Protestants and Catholics, most of whom were white. Movement participants were not merely inspired by their faith to get involved. As this photograph shows and the term sanctuary suggests, religious identity really was central to the movement itself. Um, you can see the clergy wearing their variety of stoles, for example. Um, so part of what they really sought to do through this movement was to partner what they called sanctuary families, who in practice were mixed status immigrant families who would be separated through deportation with religious communities to create conversion of hearts and minds um, of the members of the religious communities themselves through these direct interactions with immigrants. So the hope was that yes, the immigrants they were working with might have some kind of stay of deportation as a result of the movement's actions, but also that um, religious people, especially white Christians, would come as a result of their involvement in the movement to really see immigrants as their brothers and sisters, to see them as more than just strangers, to see them as members of their community um, who deserved rights um, and deserved belonging. So <laughs> let me give you one example of a specific story. Um, so Jean Montreville, and Jean um, is Haitian, so you would think his name would be pronounced Jean, but he, he actually went by Jean, um, is one example of the shape of sanctuary in this new movement. Uh, Jean migrated to the US in his teens as a green card holder, joining his family members who had already migrated here in the, in the New York City area. He was arrested during the height of the war on drugs and spent around 10 years in prison. When he was released, he got married, started his own business and had several children. However, due to retroactive changes to immigration law, he lost his legal status due to his past crime and overnight became deportable. A New York City congregation partnered with Gene and his family starting around 2007, and they went with Gene to his regular check-ins with ICE, um, advocated for his release when he was detained in 2010. However, Gene never actually lived in the church. Um, and as far as I know, that was never a consideration. So uh, that just gives you an example of how sanctuary looked different in this new version of the movement. It did not always involve, in fact, it frequently did not involve immigrants living in a church building or living in a synagogue. Instead, sanctuary was really redefined more broadly as accompaniment, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, and I'm sorry to say, because I, I did come to know Gene well during my research, that he was finally deported in 2018. So he has been living in Haiti and, and the rest of his family is still here in the US. So what are some differences uh, between sanctuary then versus sanctuary now? Um, well, in the 1980s, uh, sanctuary was more of a residence, right? Um, recent immigrants residing in houses of worship. Whereas in the 2000s and even the early 2010s, sanctuary was really redefined as something, something more like accompaniment. So congregations partnering with mixed status families, um, legal, emotional, spiritual, and financial support, um, training immigrant leaders for self-advocacy, and uh, much less frequent, frequently we do see um, immigrants residing in houses of worship like in the 1980s. Um, so, of course, the redefining of sanctuary was important because we are in a different political and religious context now, and I'll talk about that more momentarily as well. But one of the issues with this redefinition is that it did lead to some initial confusion and uncertainty about the movement strategies and aims, especially among people who were familiar with the 1980s movement and what sanctuary looked like then. Um, there was just a little bit of confusion about what this new movement was trying to do. So why would the new sanctuary movement create such a different version of sanctuary? And what consequences did that have for the movement's early successes? 
Well, to answer those questions, I think it's important to talk a little bit about um, what immigration looks like in the US today um, in the last 10, 15 years compared to 30, 40 years ago. So today, about two thirds of undocumented immigrants in the US have lived here for a decade or longer. Um, the US is their home. Uh, they are not recent arrivals. <laughs> they are people who have lived here for a long time and have roots in their local communities. So that's an important difference compared to the 1980s. Uh, living in a place longer it means that you've put down more roots, right? So um, they have more established families, more established businesses. 31% um, of undocumented adults reside, reside with at least one US citizen child under the age of 18. So about a third of undocumented immigrants in the US have at least one child who is a US citizen. Um, and really what that translates into is that 5 million US citizen children are living with at least one undocumented immigrant parent. So when we're thinking about um, you know, people's fears of having their families split apart through deportation policy. We're not talking about a small number of people. We're talking about 5 million U.S. citizen children that are in danger of, of losing a parent um, if uh, we deported every single undocumented immigrant in the U.S. And when we're thinking about um, businesses, undocumented immigrants and work, um, you know, the stereotype is often, you know, that undocumented immigrants are working in um, sort of seasonal or kind of unstable jobs, jobs that nobody else wants to do. And I mean, sure, there, there are plenty of immigrants that work in those types of jobs, but, but so many immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, are working in very stable jobs, own their own businesses, et cetera. So 20% work in professional business or other services. Um, only 20% work in construction and only 4% work in agriculture. So uh, we're talking about, again, um, people who are uh, working in stable jobs, contributing in more long-term ways to their communities. 34% own their own homes. And then finally, just in terms of um, how undocumented immigrants get here, um, you know, there's this stereotype, of course, of um, people crossing the border illegally, and around half of undocumented immigrants did arrive in the U.S. by crossing the border illegally. But the other half migrated legally um, and had a change in their status. So um, their visas expired or their asylum applications were denied or like Jean, they committed a crime or um, including nonviolent crimes that made them deportable, so their, their status changed um, over time. So in that sense, we see a really different set of needs um, with the 1980s compared to today. In the 1980s, we see mostly recent arrivals, um, people needing shelter, basic aid, and resettlement, at least the immigrants who were being helped by the sanctuary movement often fit, fit those categories. Whereas in the 2000s and 2010s, we're really talking about people who have been in the US for a long time, uh, people who have families here, have work here, contribute to their communities. What they need is papers. What they need is legalization, a way to obtain legal status. So it's a different set of needs today. Um, and that really requires a different way of thinking about what, what sanctuary means. Um, moving into a church, for example, is probably less appealing for someone like Jean, who you know, has his own home and has his own business and has to go to work every day and has to take care of his kids. Um, because once you're in the church, it's gonna be very difficult to leave. There's also differences in the political, um, the political structure and the political context today compared to the 1980s. Um, of course, in the 2000s, we're talking about post 9-11 governance. Um, in the 1980s, we have immigration and naturalization services as the, the arm of immigration enforcement. But in the 2000s, we have ICE, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. So today, immigrants are defined as threats to national security just by virtue of 
where enforcement is housed in, um, in the Department of Homeland Security. There's more danger for immigrants and for religious groups to engage in things like civil disobedience through housing immigrants on religious properties. Um, so we can see this increased level of risk in getting involved in this kind of work. And by the late 2010s, we also see just increasing public and political hostility towards immigrants. Um, we saw an end to DACA, we saw um, governors around the country rejecting um, resettlement of Syrian refugees, for example. Um, so just a lot of hostility, um, not that there wasn't hostility in the 80s, but um, really to, a, to an even more exaggerated degree. So when we think about why sanctuary looks so different today, we can think about a different set of immigrant needs and different religious and political contexts that really required activists to um, do something that was different, but they wanted to hang on to that tradition of sanctuary because it has so much strong religious symbolism and such a history um, that they could draw on that would be resonant with a lot of people. Just keeping an eye on the time here. So I'll just finish up in the next couple of minutes. So I'll have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, so I'm gonna skip this part and just move on to a couple of things that I see as challenges um, of sanctuary in our current context. So one um, has to do with um, religion. And um, using something like sanctuary that has a strong religious tradition, um, of course, has a lot of um, upsides, both strategic and moral. However, it's, it's really challenging, especially for movements that want to be interfaith. Um, and that's because it's challenging to form a shared sacred language between members of different religious traditions. And very often, sanctuary activists defaulted to Christian traditions both because most of them were Christian, but also because sanctuary has this very strong kind of history in Christian tradition. So as an example, a Muslim imam who was involved in the New York City Sanctuary Organization and was unable to convince his congregants to join, explained to me in an interview, he said, the Muslim community is aware of sanctuary, but they're not with sanctuary because it presents itself basically as a Christian organization. Singing songs with lighted candles and whatnot, that's Christian, that's not Muslim. So there's a heavy orientation of that. And that's not attractive to Muslims because they feel like, why should I be involved with that? Um, and the Imam sentiments really suggested that that predominance of Christian practices, including practices that were really strongly associated with sanctuary, really deterred people from other religious backgrounds, including religious traditions that many immigrants themselves are affiliated with, that it really deterred them from becoming involved. Um, there were also a variety of racial and class-based differences in practices. Um, and specifically, um, linguistic challenges were a real problem in the movement. Um, they often didn't have translators available. Um, many immigrants don't speak English. So in the sanctuary events I studied, uh, a lack of translators was a problem in coalition meetings and in the congregations themselves at times. And of course, this is partly a result of the fact that most congregations are monolingual. Um, and it made it really challenging to build bridges um, across uh, linguistic divides. And then finally, there were some legal and political challenges. So um, sanctuary can be a way uh, in some, some instances of just delaying the inevitable. Um, some immigrants I spoke with, for example, felt that they had been misled about the potential help they'd received with their cases if they went into sanctuary. Um, and, uh, you know, as this says here on the slide, according to sanctuary leaders, out of 37 people that entered public sanctuary in 2017, nine left with some sort of reprieve. So, you know, it's not nobody, but um, most of the people didn't really end up with any improvement in their cases. So those kinds of legal and, and political challenges um, suggest that maybe it's not always the best strategy for the specific immigrants who are getting involved in the movement. Um, and one of the goals of the movement when I studied it, as I said earlier, was to really change the way religious people themselves thought about what it meant to be religious. 
I'm not sure that this really remains a central goal of the movement today or not. Uh, but sanctuary certainly has the potential to provide a different kind of public witness compared to what we often see around religion and immigration or you know, white Christian nationalism these days. So I'm gonna stop there um, and just say, you know, thank you so much for uh, your attention. And I'll take a look at some of these questions. I'm gonna stop the share. So um, I see the first question here, as an attorney and in my volunteer work with homeless undocumented persons, I've been able to convince towns that do not allow permanent shelter of undocumented that churches have the protected right to practice the biblical directive to shelter strangers and that housing stranger guests in different churches on a rotation basis is not permanently housing. Um, and then the question is, what do other countries do where it is illegal to forbid the housing of homeless immigrants? Um, so that's a great question. And first of all, thank you for your work. Um, that sounds really interesting and important. Um, I don't know what other countries do is the answer to that. I do know there's a, a book that came out, um, gosh, it's probably been close to a decade ago now about sanctuary practices internationally. Um, and even though it is about a decade old, it might, I'm happy to put some of the information about the book in the chat in case you're interested, um, because it does have information about sanctuary, how sanctuary is practiced in other countries. Um, and it might shed at least a little bit of light on that, even if it may not be the most up to date because it's, I think, about a decade old. So I'll put that in the chat um, once you know I'm done answering questions. But thank you for that question and for sharing more about about your work. Um, and it looks like somebody else. <laughs> the, the second question is on a similar topic. Do you know how the U.S. compares and contrasts with other countries? So I'll put that information in the chat um, because yes, there's definitely some um, some differences. I know there's been, for example, um, several people who have published research on Canada and how sanctuary is practiced in Canada. So um, the people, in fact, who edited the volume I was talking about are both, I think, at Canadian universities. So, um, so that's um, one potential kind of comparison that you could look at. And then there's some other uh, case studies in that book as well. So I see one other question here. Some have said that the time and energy spent on housing endangered immigrants would be more effectively spent on changing immigration law. What do I think? So, yeah, I mean, yes, that is that is one of the arguments that is made as a criticism of sanctuary. Um, I think that it probably varies. I think if the goal is to um, change immigration law in the very near future then working on policy change is more likely to create that kind of immediate change um, than housing immigrants. I think the people who I studied at least, and some of you may be involved in sanctuary yourselves or have considered it before, um, I think for many of them, they were hoping to play kind of a long game um, where you know we're, we're doing this kind of work to build a society where people you know, who may not know immigrants and may not know their stories, start to see immigrants as people, right? Um, and start to see immigrants as members of their community and as fellow children of God, et cetera, who are deserving of rights, that that then shifts their views on immigration in a way that would allow us to create um, more comprehensive reform. So I think they saw it as a sort of more long-term strategy for creating change. Um, but the truth is, if we look at the data, you know, I showed some data at the start of this um, presentation from 2019. Um, and if we look at what happened after Trump was elected in 2016, we just don't see much change really happening in um, the hearts and minds of especially white Christians in the US. Um, and if anything, we've seen people become more conservative in certain ways around immigration policy. So I personally um, have my doubts about whether some of these more long-term strategies are working um, and wonder if we just need to focus on trying to change the policies themselves. Um, so I see one other question um, and I know we're, we're about to the time of needing to switch to, uh, to our other presenter. But Ashley, I'm happy to engage with you. If you wanna send me, anybody who has further questions, please feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat too. And I'd be happy to chat with you over email. All right.
so much, everybody, for your um, for your time and your questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. You get really, really interesting and um, some stark statistics at the beginning, but perhaps not all that surprising. <laughs> Uh, so now we'd like to welcome our final lecturer, Dr. Joyce Mercer. Thank you. And I am also going to see if I can share my screen. Let's see. Um, can people see that? All right, I am gonna assume unless somebody waves at me otherwise that you are able to see the screen. Thank you, Grace, for all that you've offered and Joel before Grace. And um, I'm struck by the language of accompaniment that you named Grace in the changing um, new sanctuary perspective because we often use that term in pastoral care to talk about how we are with people and uh, use the terms witness and witness as ways of um, understanding that. So I frame my remarks today um, as a way of um, entering into this by saying that I'm mostly gonna be talking about trauma sensitive pastoral care because we could look at um, trauma as a kind of container for a variety of the experiences that take place for people who are migrating from homelands or places they've been for a while. Um, the, the other things that go on often happen within the context of experiences, both in the uh, original place, in the process of uh, migrating and in the experience of immigration. Like a glass that contains water, the water takes the shape of the glass. That's how I'm thinking about trauma and pastoral care. So trauma-sensitive pastoral care is really an attempt to recognize the ways in which the, the experiences of trauma situate many other things in the reality, spiritual, psychological, social, physical of, of people in the situation of immigration. So for instance, we can think about how previous trauma from experiences in the country of origin or the country from which one is now migrating, like natural disaster or like um, war or famine or terror or feminicide or experiences of watching loved ones and others undergo harm. All of these can be sources of trauma before a single migratory movement is even taken. We know, for example, that the stressors that come from um, uh, the, the traumas produced by climate change, these may be long-term and shape a person's worldview and experience to expect things to be difficult, to expect to have traumatic expectation is what the psychologists call it. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And then of course the journey itself can be fraught with traumatic experiences. The dangers of travel um, through treacherous terrain or water, um, or as we're all too aware right now, the dangers that await upon arrival, such as the separation of children or the um, uh, basically incarceration in conditions that are abysmal. So when we're talking about trauma from the Greek word that means wound or damage, used to be that folks thought mostly about this in physical terms, and that's why we call um, hospitals that address um, uh, these experiences, we call them trauma centers because they're addressing the physical traumas that create great harm to the body. But of course, in this day and age, we're also referencing psychological, social, and spiritual ruptures that happen in a particular way. And the way that fundamental assumptions about the world are unsettled by these experiences that then shape and reshape lives. 
trauma upends spiritual notions of agency and communion that are very important to um, a person and a community's sense of self. So something like witnessing violence or a natural disaster, um, like an earthquake or a damaging hurricane or violent conflict or the just sheer shock of loss can generate a hu huge sense of threat to not just the individual, but a people's um, collective well-being and or their very existence in a way that overwhelms their ability to cope and undermines internal frameworks for making sense out of what's happening. And so the definitive things about trauma are that trauma overrides the usual ability to cope. And with trauma, a person has the sense of fear of annihilation, fear that their identity is going to be obliterated or that there is actual physical death. Those are often closely linked, but sometimes um, one or the other. So it's not just the event that is traumatic, it's the perception and response to the event in a person. And that's why for one person, trauma can have a traumatic seeming event can happen and they manage to use existing coping mechanisms to deal with it. And then for another person, um, their ability to cope is stymied in some way and it becomes traumatic for them. Judith Herman, who's often called the mother of trauma studies because she did some of the early work in writing characterizing trauma, said this about it, puts it really clearly. Psychological trauma is an affliction of the powerless. At the moment of trauma, the victim is rendered helpless by overwhelming force. When the force is that of nature, we speak of disasters. When the force is that of other human beings, we speak of atrocities. Traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning. The common denominator of psychological trauma is a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. We can easily link these to the experiences that many, many people have in immigration. Another place where um, immigration and trauma come together is the um, notion of worldviews. And Ronnie Janoff Bullman's assumptive worlds theory is helpful here. Um, Ronnie Janoff Bullman talks about the way in which psychological damage that occurs in trauma happens because of radical disruption in basically three assumptions that people hold prior to a traumatic experience or exposure. One of those is a kind of taken for granted belief in the goodness of the world that gets interrupted by experiences of, of horror, by atrocities, um, uh, by disasters. Another though is belief that the world and life itself is meaningful. Um, trauma shatters these kinds of um, understandings quite often because things seem to happen that remove meaning and themselves have no meaning in situations of trauma. Another would be the belief in one's own worth and value. And so we can well imagine um, experiences of uh, migration in which people are treated as less than fully human, bringing into question one's worth or value. So in effect, traumatized people and communities are um, coming to make meaning out of their experience through the lens of the expectation of traumatic threat. So there is the expectation of waiting, or it's kind of waiting for the other shoe to fall, the expectation that just around the corner is another dangerous, um, treacherous situation. Unquestionably, these three elements are part of the basic holding container for spirituality. So we can think about how when these are disrupted, a person's spiritual slash religious well-being um, is called into question and perhaps harmed. We can think about the way that experience of trauma then tears at the fabric of um, uh, a person's spirituality when they're world and their place in it is upended 
by migration. In this process, it can be very difficult for someone to trust. And trust can come into play in something as simple as an airport ticket agent saying, what is your final destination? This question by itself is not particularly endangering, but if a person's coming into a situation with traumatic expectation, there may be um, a sense of suspicion. Why does the person wanna know this about me? What, what's the trick that's going on here? How will the answer to this question be used against me? So on a deep level, the work of trauma healing involves finding some new ways to make meaning and to trust again when the formerly held worldviews, the assumptive worldviews, um, the idea that the universe can even ever be a morally coherent place and that one is of worth and value have been so deeply wounded. Psychological trauma, including the trauma that happens for people in situations of migration, generally brings about reactions of three basic types. First, continual reminders of the traumatic event insert themselves into the present in the form of intrusive memories, often in the form of intense emotions or of sensory experiences that occur in relation to reminders or what we call triggers of the trauma. Trauma sufferers thus remain entrenched in the trauma as a current present tense experience that refuses to stay in the past. A second type of trauma reaction, activation, refers to the category of reactions that include hyper arousal. So like irritability, impulsivity, sleeplessness, aggression, anger. In the face of a traumatic event, the body mobilizes its survival instincts through the sympathetic nervous system and its initiation of neurochemical agents that prime a person to move into high alert. This is the, the fight, flight, freeze mechanism I'm talking about and the activation or hyper arousal is um, uh, the fight and and flight parts of that response. And then third, deactivation refers to cluster of responses around experiences like numbness, avoiding, depression, derealization, dissociation. So persons who are affected by psychological trauma will actively attempt to avoid trauma triggers. And in the process of this defense against the potential of pain, they may go through their days in a muted level of responsiveness to their environments. Um, they may dissociate during a traumatic event. This actually functions self-protectively. Um, it removes them from the direct experience of pain by increasing uh, the kind of trauma membrane, we call it around them, that, that prevents them from um, direct intense experience of that. It positions them, in other words, as a kind of third person observer of themselves and the world that they're inhabiting. But in the aftermath of trauma, dissociation, whether in its mild forms, like what we might call just spacing out, or in its more extreme forms of amnesia or hallucinations, function to compartmentalize the traces of trauma to one domain of the personality so that the trauma pain doesn't overwhelm the whole person. I once in my time in parish ministry worked with a gentleman who was a refugee, an immigrant from Ethiopia, who developed quite a repertoire of dissociative behavior and his were auditory and vis vis visual hallucinations um, that were obviously self-protective around some experiences that he had had. And these would get triggered in various ways in the course of our um, engagements with him. And, and it became quite a serious um, uh, problem for him just in terms of functioning from day to day. So we had to seek all kinds of mental health resources for him in addition to the other things that were needed in that situation. 
Well, um, let me see what we're doing for time here. See if I can move us along. So normally we oscillate somewhere between hyperarousal and hypoarousal. That is to say, we experiencing experience things that are difficult and human beings um, get activated and we get um, deactivated, but we do that within a range that allows us to m- make use of our coping capacities to deal with whatever is causing that. In situations of traumatic stress, it's as if a person gets stuck in the on position of hyperarousal or hypoarousal. They are, in other words, constantly vigilantly aroused, constantly anxious, or constantly unaroused, constantly dissociated. So you can see how either of these extremes, if they are kind of um, perpetual through the day, would affect how a person is experienced by others and how they experience their world. The reason it matters for pastoral caregivers to understand how traumatic stress works in the lives of individuals and whole communities is that it can help us to interpret what a person might be experiencing through this lens instead of assuming certain um, motivations or perspectives to a person. So for instance, children who are in a state of continual hypo arousal may look distracted or not in touch or not present in a, in a classroom environment. If we're working with um, children in families who have immigrated, um, perhaps the experience is not that they don't care that they're checked out. It may not even be related to comprehension of language. It may simply be that that's how the embodied experience of trying to cope with traumatic stress is manifesting itself. So it can be really important to bring some understanding of this, to bring trauma sensitivity to the kinds of care and advocacy that we engage. The state of traumatic expectation is one in which trauma sufferers um, lose the normal filter that helps determine or judge whether something is actually dangerous. So in ordinary processes, if we were to be walking through a field and we happened upon a tabby cat, um, that, that sensory information would register in the brain and the prefrontal cortex would take that in and decide, okay, no danger here, things are okay, keep walking. In situations of traumatic stress, that rational control center basically gets bypassed and the response goes directly to other parts of the brain, the amygdala, amygdala, the hypothalamus, other parts of the brain that um, are responsible for alert, for signaling danger. And so instead of making a judgment about the phenomenon in front of us, a person responds as if the tabby cat is a Bengal tiger about to attack. That's especially that hyperactivated space. Trauma means that this sense of threat can become generalized to lots of situations. And in post-traumatic stress, which is often the condition under which people experience trying to be resettled in a new homeland, Um, the traumatic event won't remain in the past again, but it's continually being re-experienced through repetitive events like flashbacks or intrusive memories or nightmares or anxiety that lead to a sense of helplessness and a sense that the threat is ongoing, even if perhaps it, um, there is actual safety in the moment in, in a different way than was true Um, where people come from and what they were fleeing. But traumatic stress remains in play in people's bodies when there's an ongoing sense of threat, but also when their prior experience of 
threat is unacknowledged. So when, when people fail to take account of the depth of impact of that, it can keep the traumatic stress in play. When people are isolated, when there's not a community of um, connection to help uh, mitigate the impact of stress, and perhaps most of all, when feelings and narratives are disconnected. So what I mean by that is that the story that is the actual event of trauma gets separated from the feelings that are engendered when the stress response happens in the body. So for instance, um, um, I can, I, I have an experience of not as an immigrant, but um, when I lived in the Philippines and was hearing a lot of gunfire around me in the particular area that I lived and became rather vigilant about it. When we returned to the US, I was participating in um, a funeral service at Arlington National Cemetery. Well, in these services, they do um, gun salutes. And somehow I was just not expecting the power of that sound to reactivate bodily feelings. The sound and the sense of it got separated from the narrative event of a time when I was myself subject to and quite afraid about um, being caught in a situation where there was gunfire and um, someone close to me died there. So the, the story of my actual experience of trauma was disconnected from the feelings that I was having that got reactivated when gunfire was, was happening. We can think about so many ways that this can happen in the situation of immigration where a person's bodily response to something in the present moment reactivates the sense of trauma, but it doesn't carry with it the specific narrative or story of what happened that was the original traumatizing event. And that makes it very hard to um, address the traumatic stress in a healing way. So what do we do? How do we engage in pastoral care with people in situations where uh, trauma is a container for many of the other care needs and issues that they face? As with any other thing in pastoral care, we're not there to fix things because we can't. But we can accompany people and work toward healing that always starts with listening. And listening is not simply a hearing of words. So sometimes narrative is very fragmented in situations of post-traumatic stress. People don't have the story. They can't speak the story. The story isn't coherent or it might be re-traumatizing for them to tell the story. But listening is about listening to the person and their whole experience, listening between the lines, noticing the nonverbal ways that people speak about their experience. So we listen and then we listen some more and then we listen some more. Spirituality and spiritual care practices that are restorative, that act in the service of healing, really do have to reach beyond the limits of language. And so um, using art, using play, using movement, food, very important, um, and ritual as symbolic, non-word limited ways of engaging people can be very restorative in the service of healing. And these elements we know through um, traditions that gather around tables as a way of, of marking important moments and time and being together, that use food as a way to bring people together, that use um, uh, art or music as part of the ritual of spiritual life. So we can engage these same resources in the service of healing. The other thing about pastoral care in situations of trauma is that we might want to pay attention to the cumulative impact of trauma 
if you think about like a glass where you're pouring in the water, the water that you poured in yesterday doesn't just disappear so that you start anew. If it's there, you're pouring in and it's growing, growing, growing. And at some point the overflow happens, not because of what you poured in today, but because of the presence of all the things previously poured into that container. So it may be that in the present situation for immigrant families, communities, individuals, the present event might not be trauma inducing all by itself, but it can trigger underlying or existing traumatic stress responses. There's a young person I knew um, when I was working with immigrant congregation um, group in the DC area, who every time he was lining up at school was um, starting to act out, have all kinds of, of what the teachers named problematic behaviors. When counselors were involved, what they discovered with this young person was that he had been standing in long lines to get bread uh, in his homeland and had been in lines where he watched people being harmed um, and where he was quite anxious about making any kind of noise that he might draw attention to him, that he might be harmed. And so the act, the physical act of lining up in school was not trauma inducing per se, but triggered these existential experiences that were still part of, of his reality so that it's the cumulative impact over time um, that, that came to matter in that situation. Pastoral care in situations of trauma means empowering the personal agency or the communal agency of those who are the trauma sufferers to determine the timeline, to choose actions. And this happens a lot around just staying in relation to people. So sometimes folks say, well, pastoral care isn't really doing anything. Maybe it is not, but we can think about how trauma is an embodied experience and pastoral care with those who suffer trauma is also embodied. We give witness to the experience of trauma by forming relationships that can lead to trust, that can allow maybe a narration of the experience or some awareness that allows us to witness the suffering to stand as witnesses to what someone is going through. And then withness, a way of accompaniment that lets people know that they are not abandoned, that they are not alone. This is in my own Christian tradition, an aspect of incarnational theology, God with us, that withness that God demonstrates in the Christ is also what we are able to demonstrate in our embodied presence and accompaniment of others. And that is a powerful pastoral care resource and reality. One of the things that I say to pastoral caregivers a lot is the importance of thinking about some of the theological issues that are in play in situations where people are, for instance, um, migrating away from climate catastrophe or war or other um, um, uh, problems that they have to leave from, we have to sort out ahead of time how we are thinking about the relationship between God and suffering and evil. It's really not very helpful to people if you are thinking about these matters for the very first time theologically when you encounter that person and their suffering or that family and community and their suffering. So sorting out how you theologically as the pastoral caregiver understand these phenomena and their relationship to one another um, is, is important. It's also important to do that work with a faith community so that they are thinking about these things and building a theological repertoire for understanding these relationships that moves beyond trite phrases or uh, bumper sticker theologies that try to make everything better or smooth over the problematic aspects of these matters. There is also in 
the emerging literature on trauma in psychology and also in practical theology and pastoral theology, a notion of post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is about how um, it's possible with the eventual integration of a trauma experience into one's life and identity for there to be a transformation that takes place in the self, in relationships, and in life orientation overall, that is a good that can come from this. Now, the the footnote here is um, we don't need to seek out traumatic experience for the sake of having this kind of transformation. And especially for immigrants, it's not about putting um, a shiny silver lining on a really difficult, difficult um, experience. It's about the recognizing the potential that growthful or um, changeful in a, in a positive direction realities can happen in life out of experiences of horrible struggle and brokenness. That is both a stance of faith. It's also a psychological reality that happens with trauma where people can reach this. We can't hurry it or make it happen in pastoral care, but we can um, participate in creating the groundwork for it simply by continual, reliable witness and witness where people experience suffering. Um, The Mennonite theologian Cindy Hess once wrote that trauma sufferers become sites of violence. They hold within them the reality of the violence they've experienced, even as they move through time. And her emphasis on uh, the way violence gets inscribed on the body is pointing out in her work uh, the way that that violence is a central motif in Christian understandings. For some people, the the reality of the crucifixion, the, the story, the narrative of the crucifixion may well trigger trauma. It's a violent event. We need to think about where people are experiencing the language and the stories and the perspectives and the symbols of the tradition and be alert to how folks are not always ready to interpret in a positive or hopeful way some of these received aspects of the tradition. But we can walk alongside with people and hear how they are experiencing them and continue to lay the groundwork for witness and witness um, as we do that, because these symbols, metaphors, and stories uh, have more than one meaning. So post-traumatic growth that is positive change after trauma is a kind of long-term reality in which there's healing for pain that brings some reflective wisdom into a situation. Um, It often happens as people walk with their elders and engage their ancestors, if you will, in the wisdom of of, um, how one overcomes difficulty, not to get back as if nothing has happened, not to return to the originary pre-trauma state of things, but to integrate that into life so that it is a resource instead of an obstacle. So pastoral care, what we're doing, we're using the arts, we're using music, we're using things to tap into the ineffable. We're helping people um, give voice to interpretations of their suffering in relation to their understandings of God, the holy, the divine. We're avoiding trite responses because people have a deep longing to heal and to understand that can't be assuaged with phrases like God never gives you more than you can handle. Um, Also, we can lift up those uh, stories, narratives, and aspects of the tradition that focus on God's witness and witness, that focus on the way God is um, a very present help in trouble. So I use a lot of things from the Psalms in pastoral care and praying with people. Um, We can use images of the presence and um, incarnate 
reality of God in Christ, for instance, as a way of talking with people and walking with people in these situations. Immigration is not only about trauma. And so I don't want to leave you with a sense that everything about, oops, everything about immigration is traumatizing and traumatic. Um, what I do want to say is that um, if we, if we can understand the dynamics of trauma, we can help make sense of some of the behaviors that are out of proportion or the actions, the fears that we see that may be out of proportion to the immediate situation in the present and help to interpret those in ways that can be helpful to faith communities, but also to the people who are um, uh, working with children in educational settings, with families in other contexts, and to those who have immigrated themselves. I'm gonna stop there and let's see where we are if people have comments or more questions about this. Let's see, I see a couple questions. One is, as a hospital chaplain, I've found that Reiki can play a role when words don't come readily. Do you have experience with other parasympathetic modalities and trauma? Yes, um, this is a really important aspect of trauma-sensitive care. One thing that we know about trauma is that it is a bodily experience. If you haven't seen um, Bessel van der Kolk's New York Times bestselling book, The Body Keeps the Score, um, I urge you to to use that as a resource for a deeper understanding of these dimensions of trauma and how we respond and why we respond to it. What that means is that the things we um, can do about that also need to be related to the body. And so that's why things like art and music and, and nonverbal um, ways of engaging can be very helpful, but also prayer practices that involve the breath because breathing is one of the things about our autonomic nervous system that we actually have some control over. And breathing um, taps into the vagus nerve, which allows a kind of, uh, which connects all our organs into responses and this fight, flight, freeze mechanism that I've described allows us to exert a calming influence on the hyper arousal and a presenting influence on the hypo arousal that the body experiences of its own accord in situations of trauma. So breath prayer, centering prayer, um, just simple meditation practices, inviting people to deep breathing, often do the, that when meeting with somebody, I always do it when meeting with classes to just get present to one another in the situation. It lowers the heart rate. It does all sorts of things for the body to simply breathe deeply and slowly that can really mitigate trauma. Yeah, someone else is noting that a trap for us and this person says, especially non-pastors, but I would say pastors as well, seems to be our desire to fix the problems. Um, the things that happen that are traumatic related to migration, to, to the status of being an immigrant in societies and cultures that are hostile to them, um, they don't fix easily. You can't put a Band-Aid on this. It's way too complicated for that. And so trying to come up with the nice phrase that'll make everything okay is really not very helpful pastoral care. Pastoral care is not about solving people's problems for them. Pastoral care at its best is engaging the resources of spirituality and the tradition and what we know about lived experience of human beings toward healing where people can own for themselves and, and engage for themselves what needs to happen. We cannot fix this stuff. What we can do is walk with people as they work out what needs to take place. And we can connect them with resources. We can advocate for them in the public square. We can do all sorts of things. We can walk alongside them, but we cannot take away the pain of these situations. 
Thank you, Dr. Mercer. I know that there was probably another question in there, but I do want to give everybody a few minutes break before we move on to our conversation with our panelists today. So thank you so much for that. Our panelists today are Ashley McCarr, the Reverend Kaji Spellman Dosha, Reverend David Reed Brown, and Alan Gibbons. Ashley McCarr is the Community Liaison for IRIS, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services in New Haven. She engages congregations throughout Connecticut in IRIS's resettlement work. Ashley is a graduate of Yale Divinity School where she studied religion and literature through the Institute of Sacred Music and completed a Master's of Divinity. She is a writer with an ebook of essays called You Were Strangers, and her writings also appear in Sojourns, The Christian Century, and The Washington Post. The Reverend Kaji Spellman Doja is the senior pastor of the Park Avenue Christian Church in Manhattan. The park, as it's known, is a congregation of fearless activism in New York City. In the congregation's 206 years, she is the first woman called to the role of senior pastor. Reverend Doja is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Yale University. She's a prolific writer and a celebrated and awarded public speaker. She's on the editorial board for the United Church of Christ's Still Speaking Writers Group, president of the YDS Alumni Board, and co-chair of the New Sanctuary Coalition. The Reverend David Reed Brown is the interim minister at First Baptist Church in New Haven. He's a transitional ministry specialist and has served as a pastor or an interim pastor for 17 years. Reverend Reed Brown has taught ethics certification classes for clergy and lay leaders, was an interfaith chaplain at Hartford Hospital, and has led mission trips and service internationally. Alan Gibbons is a teacher for multilingual learners at Wilbur Cross High School in New Haven, teaches beginning English to adults at the New Haven Adult Education Center, runs an after-school program and serves as a liaison to IRIS. At First Baptist Church, he is the leader of the resettlement team, which works with Congolese refugees to establish their lives, navigate legal, schooling, health, or housing challenges, and express their faith in a new country. Thank you all for being with us. And Dr. Baden, welcome back. Thanks. Uh, thank you to everybody for being able to participate. Uh, it feels like we could hardly ever have uh, enough time to, to cover this. We definitely don't have enough time uh, today. So I don't wanna take up uh, almost any time with my with my own talking. I wanna uh, allow you all to, to, to do most of the, of the discussion. Um, uh, my hope is that over the course of um, of the conversation, you will have the opportunity to talk uh, about your your own work. Um, but I wanted to. I was hoping to start simply by by asking each of you in, in, in your various capacities what you're finding uh, at at, the, at present or over the last few years to be to be the most significant barrier that you're facing to. Uh, you know, to to doing the most meaningful and productive uh, work with uh, with immigrant and refugee communities, and again, you know, I, I know that Zoom is one of these formats where there's no obvious order to people, so I'm just going to go in the order that you're on my on my screen, if that's okay. Um, David and Alan, if you guys uh, you know can talk from your perspective of your of your community uh, first, that'd be great. Go ahead, Alan. Um. Well, I think the current reality of COVID has really complicated things um, that interacting with organizations, with immigration, with medical places has become much more impersonal uh, and much more challenging uh, and for which the accompaniment uh, that was mentioned previously is so key uh, to, the, to go as a in-between uh, between the, the people needing services and what is being required of them. But I think that's the biggest challenge right now. The first thing I noticed when I came to First Baptist um, is the effects of trauma on the community. And trauma is very isolating. It, it, it makes, it's a very individual experience. Uh, PTSD can be woven into community and experienced that way as well. 
things that are like echoes that go off of each other. But with the pandemic going on, for example, just trying to get people vaccinated and trust that the shot is going to do them some good. Um, coming up against that kind of thing has been uh, very challenging for me pastorally. And again, it's just a matter of being with. We had a death of an infant recently in our uh, Congolese community, very young. And I felt like all I could do was get in there among them and the women that had gathered, one of, one of my parishioners, and just be with them um, and rattle off scripture. But um, just that, that, that Kairos time-stopping individual experience of trauma, I think for me pastorally has been the biggest challenge. Thank you. Kaji? Thank you uh, for this question, Joel. I've, and also, just, I consider you a rock star, so I'm really excited to be on here with you um, and all of you. We, I think the biggest challenge to our pastoral care to migrants is really just whiteness in general, which is a project that, first of all, whiteness doesn't exist. So it's a project that keeps having to limit blessings. And if we want to change anything about policy, which is really where the pastoral care has to go because everything is so one-off and random and based on people's access to, um, to whiteness, honestly, um, what we find is that our border policies are in place in order to maintain whiteness in America. And so I think the big project becomes, you know, decoupling white Jesus from church, um, helping white Americans to understand that they're not the only people who get to move around when they need access to blessings and resources and so forth. And, um, and stopping, you know, as we're talking about the stranger in our midst, uh, to stop estranging others as they try to you know, better their lives in one way or another. I think that's the biggest challenge that we find right now as, as a nation. Ashley? You're still muted, Ashley, sorry. I'm so sorry. There we go. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm, I, I'm just so grateful to be on this panel with all of you and also um, your responses are so, rich and helpful um, in, in, in my work, in Iris's work. Um, and I'll, I'll start with, um, you know, um, Pastor Reed Brown's response of, of that, just the challenge of being present in that Kairos moment of trauma, um, which is so beautiful and hard and sacred. And I think one of the greatest challenges from, you know, Iris is a refugee resettlement agency and we also work with immigrants who are not who do not have refugee status and one of the biggest challenges is there's no room for that in sort of the social service side of um, working with refugees and immigrants and you know we of course we have amazing social workers on staff and wonderfully compassionate staff members who want to be present with people and listen to people. And we all do that as much as we can, but nothing, there's no space. There's not the kind of space and time that, you know, what um, Reverend, My uh, Reverend Meyer was talking about, that really deep trauma sensitive engagement that takes so much time and patience. Um, so I'm so grateful. I mean, I've, I've loved knowing um, how the whole First Baptist Congolese half of their congregation has developed because that, that relationship wasn't even brokered by Iris. It happened quite organically. Um, I think it was Pastor Joshua from DRC started going there and then more Congolese started coming and they started going there. And now I understand that Pastor Joshua preaches sometimes. And, and so I love seeing this mutuality and mutually transformative um, thing that has happened there, which, um, you know, it, it's, it's honestly just a comfort for, you know, from the perspective of Irish staff to know that all of those Congolese people that I see 
or used to see pre-pandemic, pre-working from home, used to see all the time and know that they are going through very, very difficult things, that they have a spiritual community. Um, so, so I would say in terms of, of responding to, to Professor Baden's question about the barrier, barrier is lack of time and resources among social service providers and, and not just, you know, resettlement agencies, but like the healthcare system, the school system, you know, all of these systems that um, immigrants and refugees and, you know, native born Americans have to, need to navigate and engage with in order to, um, you know, basically try to flourish in, frankly, a society that doesn't take care of people, uh, systems that don't take care of people. Um, so, you know, I, I also really appreciate Pastor Kaji's discussion of, of access, like access is a tremendous barrier. So, you know, any person who, who would say like, oh, you know, there's, there are food stamps and there's Medicaid. I mean, that's not even undocumented. People don't have access to that. But anyone who would say that for, you know, immigrants who do have access to that, it's, it's, it, would, it takes so much work and navigating bureaucracy to even get access to food stamps. So, and the systems that people need to engage with in order to get access to basic things like food and healthcare for those who are deemed eligible is, is, un, is just absolutely, like that's not access. Um, and, you know, yeah, the, 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 it's more accessible to white people who are native English speakers who, have whatever you know familiarity or ability to navigate these systems um, than the than the people you know certainly immigrants whose native language isn't English but I mean if anybody has has tried to do paperwork for the Department of Social Services or the Social Security Administration you'll know that it's 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 very hard to navigate um, and even the healthcare system. Um, and that's been, I mean, I know Yale New Haven Hospital has done amazing work in terms of, you know, there's a refugee clinic and, and providing, um, you know, culturally sensitive care. But, but I, I have witnessed that, you know, it's really, um, it's really inadequate and there's not much time and, um, yeah, there, there's not much space and time for, for trauma sensitive care, which is what refugees and immigrants really need in all of the systems that they navigate. Uh, anybody uh, else on the panel want to respond to Ashley or to anything you've heard previously before I, more you, less me. <laughs> David, go ahead. You know, I can't overemphasize enough how much people need advocates and to go through the training with Iris and to just go and be with folks and to listen and to walk beside them and to help them access those resources and use whatever identity you have to push open the door and take yourself out of the middle and put them there um, and give them, you know, just lots of, in, in language of our tradition, resurrection, hope, you know, that love that embraces grief and just encourages people to keep on going and going and going until they find that meaning and joy again. It requires other people to walk beside and just to take that time. Um, we, we have um, Amy Johnson, who's a doctor in our church and um, single, and she's with our Congolese folk all the time, um, driving them to the airport, helping them access health care, um, celebrating birthdays. Um, just so doing that, just going, you know, your regular Joe and Jane Schmo, uh, going and getting trained and walking beside them is, is key. Nikaji. I think, um, I really appreciate and just love the care and sensitivity that's being communicated here. And I also think that as we do this work, 
I, I don't know. I started off in this in this ministry um, sort of by accident, but it began, yes, absolutely by accompanying people and standing next to them. And then I just, as we do it, and as we see just all the twists and turns that our structures put people through, that put them through such harm, that we ourselves impose as a country. I mean, I think it, the natural next step is to really think on the broader picture, like how do we resolve this? Because it just always feels like, you know, you take one step forward with one family, you get good news for one family, and, and, and then so many others you don't. And reframing the language here, I really appreciate the welcoming the stranger, Although strange, there's a word that's strange in there. And there's a word that, again, I say estrangement, which we are very, very good at here in the United States. Uh, we have to get to the policy pieces of this. And church has been so complicit and so terrible about not reframing things to understand, you know, entertaining angels unawares instead, or, you know, um, understanding that when we if we believe in the Imago Dei, um, that when we are encountering someone else, we see the face of Christ, and then we deport them, we are deporting Jesus. I mean, thinking in that kind of language is very important, and we just don't hear this from enough pulpits, which makes us complicit in suffering. Church has to not just serve but reframe things so that we don't treat people this way. And uh, I love it when we start getting involved in policy. If Christians actually started treating people as if this were Jesus on fleeing to Egypt, you know, um, things would be different. Yeah, that's uh, authentically my, my next question. You couldn't have you answered it already any better was to was the extent to which uh in in your minds uh sort of faith communities uh and faith work needs to be in conversation with you know government and, and public policy or in opposition to it um what is the what is the role and responsibility of uh people of faith and faith communities in you know keeping in keeping in mind some conceptual structure of a separation of of church and state but also keeping in mind the you know the obvious public policy ramifications of and demands of uh, the kind of faithful work that, that you guys are are engaged in i'll just add one more thing here joel before others come in since i was just talking about it i i have found that the most natural partners especially in new york city where we do so we you know we're a sanctuary city and became that way because of faith leader engagement. The most natural partners and most eager um, partners in this work have not, have been immigrant led churches, which there are plenty of in our community, but also um, the uh, Jewish institutions of the city have really been the ones that have stepped up way more than mainline Protestant churches, except in services. So moving from service to policy work, has been most strongly um, done, at least in New York City, through uh, the Jewish institutions in our midst. So I think that interfaith partnership is really, really important um, and not to see it just as a church project. Others feel free to jump in. Um, well, I you know, totally agree with you know, the big, huge policy changes and all that. I'd noticed a significant change in my school. I'm at, in New Haven, Webercross High School with the uh, Muslim practicing immigrants. Um, just the getting Eid off as a holiday has really elevated the community, has given me as a teacher an opportunity to, to talk more openly about uh, this other practice, you know, why don't we have school tomorrow? Oh, it's because of Eid, but well, what is Eid? Uh, you know, that, that there are some simpler things that can be accomplished that will make significant uh, changes in, in the acceptance of immigrants. Anyone else? I just wanna echo, um, 
what Alan just said, like there's, there's a lot of not, not to detract from the need for like comprehensive immigration reform, but to, to engage at that very local advocacy level is so powerful. And I think that it can help people, you know, right. Like advocating for Eid to be basically a public holiday and, and for you know students to have that off and then experiencing and, and, and appreciating that and that being part of people's lives and the, everyone who engages with the New Haven public school system can be transformative in a way that can be generative and can um, kind of activate people to, to do more at the, you know, at, at the state and national levels, but also not to like at those larger systemic levels, not to only focus on immigration policy because, you know, it's, it's the whole broken system of like, people don't have enough food in this country. People don't have adequate health care. And, you know, one thing that Iris has found that's been tremendous is that people, you know, people who partner with Iris to resettle refugee families then become more interested in, in a lot of policy issues like affordable housing and health care and things like that. So, just this like larger vision of communities of mutual care um, is, is really important. And I think, you know, when, when Professor Baden was speaking, I was, I was wishing that there were a way or trying to think like, how could we as contemporary Americans and people of faith inhabit the biblical ethic of like, everybody is strangers, you too could be a stranger, sort of getting out of that host and stranger mentality, which even for people who are sympathetic to immigrants can be estranging to them and disempowering to them. So just, just trying to, I mean, this is, you know, a lot of longer term work, but kind of reorienting towards more mutuality and, um, you know, we are all strangers and we all, we are all sharing this country and we need to share the resources here in a way that's, um, enables everyone to flourish. David, go ahead. Just for congregations interested in getting involved in advocacy and working at a systemic level, I was um, at the Get Your Knee Off Our Necks uh, March in Washington uh, at the end of August, um, two Augusts ago. And um, Martin Luther King the third and Reverend Al Sharpton, the family of Breonna Taylor, many more, we're constantly emphasizing that if we really want things to change, there are three places to focus, and that's legislation, elections, and the courts. And I know people, you know, will uplift, hey, separation of church and state. Yes, I'm, um, I'm an American Baptist. The Northern abolitionist tradition sort of began with real religious liberty being um, granted in the colony of Rhode Island for the first time, like any, most any place on earth. Um, the first amendment established that the first amendment clause about separation of church and state is about, um, the church will not establish religion and the church will not hinder its practice. But in terms of engaging and speaking truth to power, I think there's a lot of room, um, and certainly a lot of scriptural support. So if you wanted to engage in one of those three areas as a congregation to pay for attorneys to engage the courts, to get to the, rea the rallies with Senator Christopher Murphy in, in the state of Connecticut, to learn what the legislation is and to actually call, do not email your representatives. Those are kind of set aside, call them. Even if you just take three minutes, call them. If you have the number for the legislation, that's fantastic. If you have a personal anecdote that you can share that is meaningful that the representative could use, they'll often call you back and get permission for that. So one of the things that I, uh, you know, struggle with as, as I think about this and as I actually heard uh, among among some of the the discussion we've had so far is you know uh when we talk about things like being with like withness as it were um 
and and I hear and I hear uh, Kaji talking about the language of estrangement. Uh, it seems to me that there are, you know, sort of there's there's a, a real tension going on here. Um, being to say we want to be with someone is is already to in, in a sense as wonderful as, as as it is conceptually is already to to create a we and them uh, situation, right? We are being with them. Uh, and, and so I, I, you know, I wonder to what extent uh, what, we're, what we're dealing with here is a, a situation where we, we can't, we're, we're still struggling with all the best intentions to get past a, um, an othering kind of situation or a situation in which we recognize that we are, we are, you know, uh, Kaji said, welcoming the stranger is weird because the strange word, but also the welcome word. Right, uh, the notion that you know, you, welcome to our our world, as it were. Uh, to what extent are we uh, saying to the you know to to immigrants and refugees, you're well you're welcome here in our space, uh, or saying, you know, we're going to change our space. You you change our space such that it becomes uh, something new and some and something and something different. There's lots of obviously complexities to that, but I, I would I would love to hear you all talk about how that how that plays out, uh, you know, in 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 big theoretical terms. In the case, David and Alan, of you know your congregation, where you've you know you've got a significant population, that is, is is assimilating? Is it changing you? Is it a mutual thing? And to what extent? Where are the bound, boundaries and borders and uh, to that? Um, and Ashley, of course. You know, you're looking and seeing this all the time. It's, uh, you know, integrating, but how how much of it is is also, you know, us uh, as it were uh, ad adjusting. Uh, Kaji, I saw that you were ready to talk. <laughs> I'm always ready to talk, so I'll just try not to take up too much space with this. But I, I, we have to always acknowledge that all of these things are interpreted by lenses that are so deeply politically charged. I mean, one of the easiest ways to win an election in a white county is to other immigrants, right? So, um, and to and to demonize them. And we, we have a lot of language that we is so coded that we don't even realize that we're using. So for example, when we talk about immigrants and frame them as them as um, refugees, right? Like a lot of times people will talk about, well, we serve refugees. Well, that's part of the othering that we do because we there's major debate in the immigration advocacy communities about who the good immigrants are and who the bad immigrants are. We, we talk about um, how did you make it into the country? Of course, knowing that the easiest way to get here legally is to have the money to fly into the country, right? Um, <clears throat> we talk about whether people have overstayed visas or whether they're here with documents and papers or whether they came and crossed the border illegally without actually going to witness and see what happens at the border. Like, how is it that people make it into the country? What kind of sacrifices do they make? And again, the idea, I mean, like I talk about, <laughs> I talk about, um, what is it called? Gentrification as uh, legal white migration, right? So we gentrify or people with resources, gentrify neighborhoods because they don't have the money to live in places that are more expensive. And that's not really all that different from a family that can't make it work in whatever country they've been in that decides that they want more resources for their children and come and, and live here. But, but as we sort of frame things in terms of like only the folks who have the major trauma at home have the right to be here. Um, and instead of just thinking like, why not extend the blessings to whoever needs it and we are we and we are part of a human family and just because you were born with one thing or one color or in a particular location should have nothing to do with what blessings your life can have access to i mean all of this should be what we discuss in church from the pulpits it's very you know there's all kinds of rich biblical um, stories to help to to spur this conversation but uh again until church really really works at this it's just not going to happen it won't happen 
Um, um, if we're looking within the community that is diverse and being diversified by people coming and going, I would say there are two places to look at how well that integration, that community building is going. And the first place is actually the social hall. Um, and by that, uh, currently we have the issue of people donating things that get stored into the, the social hall and those who want to keep the church looking nice. Um, so we have that tension and we need to have a discussion and voices being heard. The second area uh, to, to check on is music, right? And I would argue it's not so much what music is being used, but how are people talking about it? And are all voices uh, being heard? Um, we're also struggling because one, uh, one tradition, the songs go on for like six, seven minutes and a language that some people don't understand. Uh, and, you know, the others, well, that's their tradition, right? So constant, constant uh, need for voices to be heard. Um, and I think in those two areas, if, if tensions are being addressed, uh, you have a, a, a signal that things are going well. I mean, I'm thinking we 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 know that as communities diversify in various ways, as their as their makeup changes, there there comes a point. There's like a, a tipping point, right, where like the tolerance for change, you know, suddenly decreases, right? It's it, there's a a line where it's like I, there's a feeling of lost identity um, that you know, I, and I can imagine in a community. Uh, in, in certain communities that have uh, that are built on a preservation of identity and tradition and ritual, right, and liturgy, that aspects that are um, that are identity forming, that the the amount of change that can be tolerated must have some sort of uh, some sort of unspoken unspoken limit. Um, and I, I'm sure I'm sure you guys encounter that to to some degree. We see it obviously in um, in communities, uh, non-faith communities, uh, you know, I see it in my own uh, institution, uh, you know, in, in, in a ver variety of ways. Uh, is it possible to imagine a, a space that I, I, I think Hikachi is pointing to, but a, a space where um, uh, the community simply is what it is rather than being a uh, rather than being a, a space of, you know, uh, we're we're bringing we're we're welcoming and bringing in an, an other into our midst, um, where the, where the midst the midst is the whole thing. <laughs> I don't know if I'm, I'm I'm being clear, but but that that sort of thing is that uh, you know. And Ashley, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to you know uh, the the process of um, of integration as as one of is, is it a, a, of assimilation of trying to help people assimilate to a, a host uh, a culture as it were, or uh, helping the culture shift such that that that's not really what's going on, or that's that's not the way it's framed or understood. So I wish it were the latter, but it really is more the former, and you know I I. It's so nice to, to be in this, um, I was a YDS student and then I've been working at IRIS for about five or six years. It's so nice to, to engage again in sort of theological language and pastoral language. And, and so I'm thinking, um, you know, of near the end of, of your lecture uh, about that eschatological vision um, of it's, it's all sharing, you know, sort of that, that sort of when, I guess what you were saying is like everything is in, in the midst rather than we are the hosts, you know, welcoming the stranger in our midst um, and being transformed to a certain extent. But, um, you know, I think in the best circles, in the best sort of approaches to integration, that, that's what's happening. But I think what, what Pastor Kaji is, is talking about, and I think what happens organically at First Baptist, um, where, 
even the the people who were like up oh, in our church space or who don't want the song to go on too long. I mean, I've, I've never had the privilege of being to a service, but I bet sometimes the song just goes on, you know, and that's and and that's a beautiful experience for for everyone or even for people who don't like it. Like it's 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 an important witness to a different way of being in the world. But I think in terms of like integration in that sort of just real social sense, unfortunately, it's still constrained by this notion. It's still it's still in the vein of assimilating um, rather than, you know, like a, a mutually a mutual integration process. Um, although I think the more um, immigrant communities feel empowered to kind of inhabit their spaces and, and be who they are, um, you know, that can be, um, you know, that can be, you know, it can move slowly in, in a different way, but I, I don't think there's a ton of space for that right now. What I try to do when I'm working with um, congregations that are partnering with IRS to resettle refugee families is to talk about like, you know, basically, a big part of your role is, is helping them learn to navigate these systems that are familiar to you. And it's not that our ways of walking in the world or our systems are any better than the cultures that they're coming from. Um, it's a matter of this is, it's almost like a language, right? Like English works better here. So that's, that's what we're trying to help them navigate doing, but holding the space of like Swahili and all of those many <laughs> Congolese languages that I'm sure come up in your congregation. Um, you know, that's, a, that's an idiom that we also need to hear, um, but it, for these very functional purposes, you know, going to the doctor, you know, you can have an interpreter, but you also need that empowerment of being able to like, you know, um, navigate that point, that appointment in English. So, yeah, I think it's it's um, it, it's a long, a very long road that I hope that that and I think faith communities have a tremendous role to play in moving that direction. Um, <laughs> you know, being together, it, it's just so funny as I think about your question, Joel, because I'm a pastor, and every pastor knows that there's going to be conflict or any faith leader knows that there's going to be conflict within the community on any number of issues. And, you know, there's been such a movement to understand our lives with purpose and purpose often drives us to think like, what do you live for? And I think what the, the kind of inverse is, and I think where we start to shift some of the demonic tendencies of our culture is to also ask, what, what would you die for? And um, and I don't just mean that like bodily, but I mean in terms of community. So if the community is sort of taken over by an unclean spirit of, you know, pushing us into fighting over tiny issues, sometimes letting that die or letting that membership die, uh, which is something I've done a lot of, <laughs> where I just say, you know, is really is this the place for you? And sometimes just allowing that release is, is so liberating for a community. And I think what we want, what we live for, what we die for is this liberation in Christ Jesus, right? And um, in, in church, I would think. And yeah, letting some things go has been um, something that many communities would not embrace on my end in pastoral leadership, but mine does. And what that has led to is so much more of, a, of what I guess some have been framing as an integrated community. I don't really know what the right language is there, um, but, but a liberated community, I think is what, what I've been after. Is the goal, I don't know how to ask this, is, is, is the goal the creation of a perfectly, blended, uh, uniform in its lack of uniformity kind of community, faith community or broader, or is it in fact, or is it in fact the, the, the preservation of the individual traditions of its various constituent 
members in their in their own ways and spaces. I, you know, I'm hearing Alan and David talk about, you know, a community within a community, right? That is, a, you know, there's a, a preservation of sort of identity markers that is it's continuing within, within, uh, you know, within this one community. Better for that community to become eventually, sort of, uh, uniform in its it, even in its diversity, or, or you know, would it would it be better for for us to live in a in a world where, for example, the Congolese community within your uh, congregation can have its own could could have its own space. I mean, are they? Are, and, and part of I'm asking, are they there because you've taken them in and they have no other? Like you're providing them access to faith and community, uh, or is it that uh, you know would would they in some alternative or future universe? Get their own church, their own community. That would be. Would that be? Would that be the goal, or, or are we trying to create something? We're trying to create. I don't know how to ask this. We're we trying to create a, a a common blended whole, or rather, multiple commonly respectful and you know uh, partnering bodies. Um, yeah, David, at the please. moment, we have both. So we have a just practically we have a service upstairs that we're trying to integrate more with language and sharing more Congolese music, Congolese readings, um, blend blended together, music styles blended together, um, liturgists speaking English and Swahili, um, sermon being translated phrase, ser uh, sentence by sentence, and then downstairs, Pastor Joshua is, is involved in um, a more Pentecostal. Uh, congregation that's come in to our church. Um, we're trying to figure out scheduling at the moment. Um, they've been with us for a number of months, almost a year now. And um, so that's all in Swahili in the more Pentecostal style, which honestly, it's a more full-bodied, um, talking about the Vanderkolk recovery from trauma stuff, it's a more full-bodied um, penetration of love and mercy and hope. So it's kind of both at the moment. We're just following where the spirit leads. Thanks for that. Uh, I mean, it's it's interesting to me. None of none of these are very, are obvious, not obvious questions or obvious answers. There's, you know, the, the I think Kaji has pointed to sort of the 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 broader societal of problems that are are at stake here. But when we're talking about the individual communities that are trying to handle it, uh, you know, there are there are so many different. There's pros and cons to so many different approaches, and it I think it's useful maybe to be able to to ask what 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 the end goal is mm -hmm. um uh, what kind of a society and what kind of a culture we're, we're, we're looking to get to uh kaji did you want to uh jump in yeah i just wanted to give a little personal anecdote from some of my earlier days at, at the park when we had uh, so i started off and we had a spanish language service and an english language service and at some point i asked why <laughs> because the community uh, you know, was very uh, blended. I mean, we had a lot of Spanish speakers, we had a lot of English speakers, we had a lot of native English speakers who spoke some Spanish. So I said, well, why, why can't we just have our service in both, one service in both language? And uh, lots of people left the church over that. And I said, thank you. You know, clearly this isn't the right place for you. Um, we had a donor uh, who I was working with who, um, had, when I say lots, like it was five people, it wasn't that many people, but um, we had a donor I was working with on our capital campaign who was um, really, really, who loved the church. He lives across the street. We're at 85th and Park Avenue for anybody who understands New York City. And um, he was working with us on a $10 million gift for our capital campaign. And I met with him multiple times, you know, went on trips with his family. We're cultivating this relationship. And he says, you're going to be able to have this gift. I just need you to stop the Spanish in the service. And I said, I don't want this gift. Sorry. And what I think I'm getting at here is that um, people use their bodies and their attendance and their financial gifts uh, to wield power within our communities. And 
and we have to figure out like what power we really want to listen to in these situations. And that's a struggle that every pastor, every congregational leader has. Um, so, you know, I, I send out lots of love and support to everybody on this call who deals with those same conversations. Uh, in the last, uh, you know, 10 to 12 minutes here, I want to make sure uh, we get some of the questions that have come in over the, the Q&A from the, from the folks who are, who are watching. Um, again, this is a conversation I think we could be having uh, for, for much longer, and there's, there's so much to, to be saying about it. Um, uh, you know, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll open with the first question that came in, which is, I hope maybe we can, uh, maybe we, we can deal with relatively swiftly, but uh, the question is, why don't more pastors speak prophetically from the pulpit? On this topic, <laughs> um, and I and I wonder whether you know to add to it whether whether there's um, whether, whether there's an inherent risk to doing so a risk of alienation of some members of the the community or uh, the culture at large and, uh, and and a risk of loss of uh, you know sort of a losing of, of identity in communities where identity creation and formation is, is just so central to sort of what the job of the, of, of the community is. Uh, any thoughts on that? I suppose I'm talking to people who probably do talk about this from the, from the, from the pulpit. Um, uh, so fair enough. Um, I, I mean, I do have an answer to that, but I think it's the, what I've been talking about this whole time, which is, uh, you know, people make, we always are making calculations about what we can pull off in church. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that they can't pull this off in their communities for various reasons. And, and I think there's also a tendency in not, you know, it's clearly not amongst the folks on, on this call, but in other places to really be afraid. I mean, we, we have a real courage issue in, especially in white church. It's just endemic to what, again, the white project is. So um, that's hard, it's hard for people. And so um, it's a little bit easier to preach about other stuff. You know, 25 years ago, when I, when I first um, brought up ad advocacy for the LGBT community in my small church in a wealthy community, um, I thought there was a chance I could lose my job. You know, so there's, there is a bank account of goodwill. Um, some of the ways that I did, though, I wrote on it. I didn't always start with the pulpit. I wrote on it. And then I prayed on it, like during the pastoral prayer. Or I talk, start touching on it, not um, specifically politically, but like the children's moment, because when the kids come up there, everybody starts to play and get into a new mindset. And so let's talk about the water, but hey, there's all sorts of containers that hold that water and they're all good. They all hold the water, but they're all different. Um, sometimes I've had the congregation sit down following the benediction. I had addressed something very seriously. I've never had to do it as much in my career as I had the last five years. But just to say, this isn't a left thing. It's not a right thing. This is a moral thing, according our, to our tradition. And like when we had concentration camps of children, I just rattled off a dozen scriptures and it changed the mind of some. It changed the mind of a, of a couple of key people in my congregation. It says, you know what? My, my political party is making it very hard to, um, for me to be Christian and be part of that right now. Um, and then, yeah, and yes, speaking from the pulpit and just, uh, and not only your internal pulpit, but your external pulpit as well. And having one of the things that's also key is having a group of supporters around you who have your back when you go out on a limb and having that prepared ahead of time. So that because you're going to, you're going to get shot at. And so you got to be there and they got to be there a small group to take care of you. And even like some of your personal needs that can have a physical effect on you. Um, and so, um, and take care of who you are, your whole body, mind, and spirit, and that all be woven together as part of it, because it will take its toll. I wonder to what extent some of the 
ways that we're talking about this are uh, spe specific to the Northeast where we're all located. Um, you know, David just talking about, you know, having a group of, having a group that's a, or a broader, you know, part of the community that supports the, the movement or the, or, or the actions, you know, uh, in New Haven, in Connecticut, in, in New York City, we're talking about relatively, relatively open places for, I mean, you know, uh, Ashley, you know, I, I, like Iris is a pretty well-loved New Haven institution, as difficult as the work is, right? Like, you know, I, I, Iris has a, has, a, has a voice in this scene and is, uh, is, is an integrated part of, uh, of the New Haven uh, life. And, uh, you know, uh, Kaji, obviously New York is, uh, you know, is, 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 is New York. Uh, how does any of this translate to areas that aren't like this? You know, how does any of the things that we're, we're talking about, how does it translate to, you know, non-Austin, Texas, right? How does it, how does it translate to, uh, you know, to, to, to other parts of the, of the, of the country or um, where, where the, you know, the, the sort of baseline of tolerance and acceptance is, is just, is different. Um, you know, is, is this, are those places where, uh, where we can just we sort of can just expect this not this experiment as it were not to work as well, are we creating a divided? Um, I mean, creating a divided country. But are we? You know, is this is this part of the division? And and, and is it is that a division that exists as you see it uh, within you know uh, Christianity as a as a whole? And I don't mean the evangelical non evangelical divide, but even just geographically. Yeah, I have thoughts on this because our work is definitely national. Um, so it, as it started to become national, so just even just within the sanctuary movement, I would say prior to the last administration, things were much more fractured in terms of what um, immigration advocacy spaces within faith communities looked like. And the sanctuary movement is just a really helpful model for this because it's so old and did start in Tucson, Arizona and made its way across the country in various ways. And because we were so fractured and also just, you know, anybody who knows activists knows that it can be, you know, activists can be kind of, um, you know, it's a particular breed of person. Um, so, you know, we would get into these meetings and just like fight all day and there was no Zoom and you'd be on the phone and there was no way to really build relationship. But uh, in the last administration, particularly around family separation, you really started to see people pulling together in new ways. And um, because we had to, we had to figure out like, okay, you just saw a plane take off with children like 20 kids uh, under seven with one um, agent with a gun. And we saw that that plane is going to um, Chicago. And so then we get in touch with the Chicago congregations and they, people who had never done this work before started to show up at the airport, you know, with signs in Spanish and, you know, Creole and other languages saying, you know, we're going to find you, hang in there, we love you. They started yelling outside of the centers where they were being held. And my point is that uh, in the point of crisis where people really started to pay attention to these issues, we, we found that we had to be more coordinated. And, and that's, I think, part of where this is headed is that yeah, I mean, all these issues are, because I served a congregation in San Diego at the border, which is part of how um, I got involved in working in Tijuana, which I still do. Um, what we found is that we need to be in communication and we need to meet and witness and accompany migrants as they try to make their way to a, a life that that is thriving. And, um, and it has to be coordinated. So yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't think this is particular to the Northeast in that way. Um, I, I think that lots of communities are really trying to grapple with the best way to move from where we have been on migration to where we need to be. And, and there's not a lot of consistency, but there's a lot more coordination. 
Thanks. Uh, it would, it perhaps as a, as a last thought as we're approaching the time here, and, and I'm looking at one of the questions from uh, from the from the participants. Um, less of a question and more of a more of a statement here. It says it, it just says this will not happen, and I assume it just is that this is referring to some. Uh, wonderful vision we had about how we'd all like this to go. Uh, until imago dei is embraced as a core value of uh, faith slash community. And I know Kaji had brought up imago dei earlier. And, and, and I wonder to, um, to, to put that as a sort of as, as a question or something for, for the panel to, to think about is, imago dei is a, a is, is a, a, a lovely value, but also kind of a loaded term because the imago dei is not consistent from um, imago to imago, uh, so, right? Like, um, and, I, and I'm thinking back to, you know, you know I mean, Kaj, I think you brought up white Jesus at the very beginning of this. Um, you know, what's the, um, uh, and, and I guess I was asking earlier, right? What was the, the ultimate sort of core value here? What is the, what is the imago dei? What does it look like? And 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 how does you know how 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 do we construct that in such a way that uh, that the, that work with 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 immigrants or with any sort of um, any sort of uh, sort of other kind of community other uh, at, 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 other at the moment community. Um, how, do, how does that come into play, the, the, the notion of Imago Dei and our construction of, of Imago Dei? And uh, uh, I'll give everyone a chance to sort of chat about that for a moment before we log off. I mean, I can talk about this for hours, so, but I wanna let the <laughs> colleagues come in here. <laughs> so please, y'all first. Yeah, I, okay, so just to jump in, I think what what our image of God is, is, is something that we have to continue to pr pray about and work on because we're, you know, prone to sin on this issue. And, um, and it's something that I continue to have to work on. So for example, when I believe myself to see the face of Jesus in every human, um, it's hard because you know I work with ICE agents and CBP officers who do the demonic, and and so I have to think like, all right, darn it, you're Jesus too. Like, come on, <laughs> like, how do I deal with this? So uh, you know, in working with people who are um, I what I consider to be em enemies, and thinking about like, what does it mean to love your enemy? but also to um, hate what is evil, you know, Romans 12. So I'm, I'm like, I, I don't know. It's very, very difficult. And it's something, it's probably the hardest thing I fight with God about in my prayer life <laughs> because I, I really don't wanna consider everybody, you know, the face of Christ, but yet that's the work that, that I have to do. So um, I'm just curious about how other colleagues struggle with that. I mean, literally every week when I'm choosing what image to put on the bulletin cover or what goes in the email, I got to think about, okay, all right, that's a white male from the United States, all right? That's not our all of our Imago Dei in this congregation and, and even others who are not in this congregation, but just practically what images am I putting out there in the language that I use? And when I get together with someone, um, you know, angels unawares is very important to me. I was, there's a Presbyterian church in DC that has that chiseled above, in stone above the um, fireplace where they where they have fellowship hour. Um, oh, geez, and now I'm lost in my train of thought. Um, but just being willing to accept and be uncomfortable with the fact that the person I'm talking to, no matter who they are, no matter how uncomfortable I feel has something positive to share with me as I'm sharing something with them. I'm just as I need to be just as willing to, to learn from them as I want them to learn from me, if that makes any sense. 
Um, and also accept that, hey, I might be wrong here. This is just my culture. I don't know what it's like for them. Um, even if I think that my biblical interpretation is correct, and let them have theirs. You know, that's just a couple practical things. What if I told you that no biblical interpretation is correct? <laughs> that's another conference. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, it is indeed. Um, let me uh, let me uh, close here by uh, by thanking uh, all of you for participating. Uh, it's like such a delight to be able to get all of you in the same you know uh, virtual room uh, to to be talking about this. Like so many interesting and wonderful uh, perspectives from uh, you know different practical uh, and and sort of and theoretical uh, approaches. Um, so I'm grateful to uh, all four of you for participating. I'm grateful to uh, obviously to Joyce and Grace for the talks that uh, occurred earlier. I wanna thank Kelly and Megan um, for making this possible on all of the logistic grounds and bringing this together in, uh, in such a nice way. And I wanna remind everybody that uh, this is all going to be uh, available. The recording of this will all be available uh, through the uh, Center for Continuing Education's website uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks, and we will let people know um, when that has happened. Uh, again, thanks so much, obviously, for everybody who is participating uh, and watching, and I hope that uh, this uh, was helpful and, uh, and thought-provoking, and hopefully the first of many such conversations about sort of you know, faith and contemporary issues in the world. Uh, so one more thanks to the panel, and, uh, and thanks to everyone else. And, uh, Everyone have a, have a good rest of the weekend. Thanks so much.